It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. What a great panel this week. Harry McCracken, the technologizers here. From Wired Magazine, the great Paris Martineau. Michael Nunez from Mashable. We'll start off by talking about Elon Musk. Then self-propagating negativity. The amorphous ball of rage in France. The super micro audit. Was Bloomberg completely wrong in YouTube? <laughs> and the most hated video of all time. It's all coming up next on Twit. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 697, recorded Sunday, December 16th, 2018. The Big Leak Cabal. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Avnet. Avnet and Not Impossible Labs created an historic event at the Life is Beautiful Music Festival, a first of its kind, a live concert that helped the deaf and hearing communities experience music together in a whole new way. Visit avnet.com slash music1 to see the journey. And by Blue Apron. Blue Apron makes cooking fun and easy. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free at blueapron.com slash twit. And by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. Introducing Rate Shield Approval. If you're in the market to buy a home, Rate Shield Approval locks up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. It's a real game changer. Learn more and get started at rocketmortgage.com slash twit2. And by Molecule. Molecule is the world's first molecular air purifier that reduces symptoms for allergy and asthma sufferers. For $75 off your first order, visit Molecule.com and enter the promo code TWIT75. It's time for TWIT This Week in Tech, the show where we get together with the best minds in technology to try to figure out what the heck is going on uh, <laughs> this week in tech. The technologizers with me in in studio, Harry McCracken, always a thrill. Thank you, thank you, Harry. Great to be here, Leo. Uh, and you came up in the rain. Is Marie also here? I think I She's saw her briefly. She's wandering your hallways, I think. <laughs> Don't. She can borrow my bike if she wants. You see my e-bike? Did you? Do you like that? The uh, the Super Seventy Three came. How is it? It's not a bike. It's got pedals, but what it really is is an electric moped that's disguised as a bicycle. You can't see it because of where it is, but it's. Uh, Harry can see it. It's really fun. Uh, also with us, got to welcome uh, him back. We haven't seen Michael in a while. Michael Nunez, deputy tech editor at Mashable, in the Mashable offices in beautiful Manhattan. Hello, Michael. Hey, thanks for having me. Good to see you. And we want to welcome a new member of the panel, but I'm thrilled to have her because her name has come up many times in the last uh, months on Twit. She's a staff writer at Wired, Paris Martineau. Uh, remember Hi, that? Remember that Lashify story we were talking about the Instagram influencers? That's Paris. She's done great work. If you just look at her uh, stuff on uh, Wired, it's great to have you. Thank you for joining us. I don't know. I almost yeah, don't be here. don't know where to begin. There's so many uh, boring stories this week, <laughs> <laughs> and I could start with the crazy story of Elon Musk. Oh, let's do it. It's a Wired story. Uh, this is not yours, I should say. Charles Duhigg, uh, who also does a great job. Dr. Elon and Mr. Musk, life inside Tesla's production hell. I'm a fan of Tesla. I drive a Model X. But now, after reading this, I'm really second-guessing whether I should buy another Tesla. He sounds worse than Steve Jobs, if that's possible. He sounds the <laughs> same in person as he is on Twitter. Yes. Which isn't always true of everybody. Yes. The crazy Elon on Twitter? He's like that. Uh, about 10, he's, he, uh, um, Duhigg's talking about uh, the Gigafactory and problems at the Gigafactory. And uh, about 10 o'clock on a Saturday evening, angry, an angry Musk was examining one of the production line's mechanized modules, trying to figure out what was wrong, when the young, excited engineer that he talks about earlier in the article, was brought over to assist him. The guy was really excited. I'm going to meet Elon. I'm here. I'm working at the, at the Giga factory. He, he, he had, you know, he'd been living out of a suitcase, putting in 13-hour days, seven days a week over the last year. It was his first real job. And now a colleague had tra tracked him down to say, Elon Musk wanted his help. So he came running over. Musk shouts at him, hey, buddy. 
He doesn't even know his name. This doesn't work! Matt Musk shouted at the engineer, according to someone who heard the conversation. Did you do this? The engineer was taken aback. He'd never met Musk before. Musk didn't even know the engineer's name. The young man wasn't certain what exactly Musk was asking him. Or why he sounded so angry. You mean program the robot, the engineer said, or, or design that tool? Did you effing do this? Musk asked him again. Uh, I'm not sure what you're referring to, the engineer replied, apologetic. You're an effing idiot! Musk shouted back. Get the F out and don't come back! And he was fired. Gone. The entire conversation had lasted less than a minute. <laughs> and on and on and on. And it really makes you wonder, holy cow. Um, how can this company survive this guy? Thoughts? Yeah. What really <laughs> stuck out to me is, yeah, how can this company survive this guy? And where would Tesla be if it was a place that was not a living nightmare like this? I feel like we often have this, uh, or the tech community at large kind of idealize these eccentric genius CEO personalities, whether it's Elon Musk or Steve Jobs. But it seems like Tesla engineers or just as a workplace in general, it would be much better and perhaps more productive. All of these people didn't have to feel like they were walking on eggshells every single minute working with this, uh, I guess, eccentric uh, madman. I have to. Yeah, to I, want, I want to honor him. I think you're going to do that, Michael. So I'll let you. But I want. I mean, he, Tesla might not even exist without Elon Musk, too, right? Well, oh yeah, uh, no. I mean, I I think it's great. Like Elon Musk. But one part that said about this article is that a lot of people praised Elon Musk for being a great boss for a visionary. A lot, all of the a visionary. Yeah, the things that he brought to Tesla and the things that he did with Tesla cannot be understated. But like. Where would Tesla be if his team felt support or even less than support, just the fact that they weren't going to be fired if they happened to have a conversation with their CEO? Go ahead, go ahead Michael. Right, yeah, I think, uh, well, Tesla absolutely wouldn't exist without, without Elon. I think he often gets a little bit more credit than he deserves because I think Tesla realistically doesn't have a very big edge in, in any of the technologies that they're producing. So a lot of people can make electric engines, uh, Tesla does batteries really well. That's their big bet. So if Tesla can make batteries better than anyone in the world, that company will continue to exist. If they can't, then uh, then they'll lose their edge. Uh, and so it's a lot of people getting really excited about battery technology, which is kind of funny to me. Um, but I think ultimately Tesla is a company that's kind of a cult of personality. You know, people go there to work for Elon Musk. Uh, the people that I've talked to that have been uh, that have worked closely with Elon have said that it's extremely difficult, that uh, that he tends to choose favorites and he quickly tires of those favorites and and finds ways to excise them from the company or from his inner circle. And uh, it's really, uh, you know, it's an anxiety ridden company. I think it's it sounds very exhausting. But also, you know, the thing that I've learned over the course of my career is that Companies can operate this way. Unfortunately, this is just uh, this is just bad leadership, or or it's a type of leadership. And some people tend to rule things based on fear and based on um, you know whether people are are drinking the Kool Aid, whether people really buy into uh, into the the leader's idea. So Steve Jobs would be a prime example of that. Um, I've I've certainly worked at places that that are run like that. Um, but you was know, Pete I think Cashmore that kind of crazy? <laughs> no, no, Pete Cashmore is he's uh, the sweetest guy individual. I've ever he, met. No. Yeah, yeah, he is extremely nice. Um, yeah. But 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 there are other places definitely in media that are that are run by these types of personalities. And I'm sure, like even in the you know maybe an easier way to say this is um, during the during the golden era of magazines. I think you saw even bigger personalities that were that were running a lot of uh, a lot of big um, a lot of big you know the big magazines. But um, but yeah, my point is that you think uh, Thomas that Edison. Not, somebody in the chat room saying, "Do you think Thomas Edison was it was as hard to work for as Steve Jobs or Elon Musk?" On a bad day, I would imagine so. But um, you know, I, I I wonder if there's a toxic culture that is unique to Silicon Valley. Because I mean, so one one response from Tesla's general counsel to this Wired story: uh, there are a lot of people outside Tesla who will sort of sugar sugarcoat what they actually think of your performance or of an issue because they don't want to have that hard conversation. Musk is someone who puts a lot of effort into forcing himself to be fully honest. This is what Reed Hastings is is kind of dinged for sometimes at, at Netflix, for radical honesty. There's such a thing as being radically honest, but there's also such a thing as pointlessly treating people terribly. 
I think it's, uh, it seems like t Tesla did not really deny the substance of anything in the story. No. They they just said that the context hey, wasn't always that's how, there. That's how we run it. Um, I mean, more and more, I've been reading all these stories about CBS, which seemed to have a culture Less of, 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 thinking, yeah. of thinking that uh, even several levels below Moonves, the theory was that if you were talented, it was okay if you treated your colleagues horribly. Right. And that more and more, I think there is no excuse for cultures that allow anybody including the CEO, to treat other people horribly. And that is a distinct thing from making hard decisions or, or holding people to a high standard of competence. Yeah, and I also, do, I wouldn't conflate radical transparency with with exactly what Harry just said, uh, you know, treating people poorly. So I've worked at, you know, Gawker Media uh, embraced radical transparency. Uh, Bridgewater Capital, a hedge fund, uh, is famously run by a guy named Ray Dalio, who embraces radical transparency. Both of those places are difficult to work at, um, and... Uh, you might be confronted with 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 some of your weaknesses regularly, but I don't think that's the same type of thing as like throwing a tantrum. You know, it sounds like Elon Musk is motivated uh, by uh, he, he. I think he lets his emotions get the the best of him more frequently than he'd probably like to admit. I mean, if Elon was a guy on the assembly line, he would not be allowed to treat people as badly as he's allowed. Well, to, but we to have heard people. stories about racism and other problems on the assembly line as well. There's. Uh, you know, it starts at the top, but and I'm not saying Elon's a racist, but there are problems on the assembly. Which is one reason why you don't want people at the top to behave like jackasses, right. because it, it, it becomes part of your culture. Yeah, yeah, especially because it kind of uh, strengthens this culture where there is no transparency, where uh, perhaps an employ any employee who I guess is an Elon could not bring up an issue that they see or be able to, if let's say Tesla hires some really smart people. And uh, if any of them had perhaps an idea that conflicted with a direct order, I guess from Elon or someone above them, this sort of culture negates any opportunity for them to bring up what they th think could, I guess, be one of the ne next best Tesla features. He's the, <laughs> he could, the 60 Minutes piece on Sunday was pretty negative, <laughs> right? I mean, that's kind of, that's yeah. kind of, and he, even Musk himself pointed out that, you know, 10 years ago, they did a piece on me and I was the Messiah. What happened? Uh, he well, he's, he's a happened, much greater Elon antagonist. And yeah. yeah. And, 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 the, and he's he made more provocative comments in this interview yeah. purposely, I think. Well, he said, I talked to him for five hours. They they put the most provocative 15 minutes on. Uh, I That's see. TV. Okay. That's TV. You got to be careful what you say. Elon says he's been misunderstood and mistreated by journalists. And maybe he has. And I do. And I, you know, I bought a Tesla. He, I don't know if there would be an electric car industry if he hadn't paved the way. And of course, now government's trying to el eliminate uh, uh, emissions or, try, you know, are trying to move towards electric. So his timing was good. You can't say it's entirely him. But I, I think he is a visionary. And I think he did have a vision. And I think he wanted to do good things. And this is, reminds me a lot of Steve Jobs, who had both bad and good. Right, we're old enough to live through that. Era. He, he was certainly um, accused of very similar behavior at his worst. Yeah, oh, very uh, similar. He, I mean, yeah. he also had days where he held people to a impossibly high standard, and it was a great thing. And he probably did it in a way that that was not terrible, just hard. Yeah, and I and I don't really mean to pick on Elon. I'm more interested in if if there's this sense in Silicon Valley that you have to have a toxic culture to get things done. I mean, people felt like, and people flocked around Steve Jobs and put up with the difficulty of working at Apple because they thought they were changing the world. I imagine it's the same at SpaceX and Tesla. Um, you're there because you're making a big difference and you're going to put up with the tough conditions because that's maybe what it takes to make something insanely great. Yeah, I tend to I tend to disagree with that. I mean, look at, I, it's just like, try to imagine Tim Cook doing what, what, what we've just read about Elon Musk in that Wired feature story, or think about uh, Sundar Pichai doing acting in the same way. The, I think you can run a competitive business and be a reasonable human being, and uh, and there's so many examples of of balanced tech leaders. Bill Gates, I think, you know, is not running through uh, manufacturing facilities and yelling at people. I, I'm sure it was. I'm sure there were periods at Microsoft that were very difficult and uh, and and you know had high demands on on a lot of the employees but I think at the end of the day you know Elon seems a little bit more self-absorbed than these guys and I think he wants it to be a cult of personality he wants to be seen as someone that 
has a lot of money that, and, and a lot of brilliant ideas. And uh, those two things may be true, but I think he's also become annoyed that uh, that he's being held accountable for his actions, right? Like, I mean, to say that uh, in the 60 Minutes interview, for example, to say, uh, I do not respect the SEC after you've been, uh, too, you know, investigated by them. <laughs> yeah. you, you, you may not respect them, but they have the power to, to fine you $20 million it's, for a tweet. It's harder to get away with this stuff baffling. if you're not a, a founder or a pseudo founder, as um, Elon is with, right. with Tesla. Yeah, I mean, he didn't actually found Tesla, yeah. but he, but he made Tim, it work. I mean, Tim Cook, there are tons of stories about Tim Cook not being warm and fuzzy and being hard-nosed and incredibly demanding. Um, but I haven't heard any about the bleed into him being unpleasant for the sake of being unpleasant. Duhigg also has an article in The Atlantic this month about American rage. And... Uh, the the untold story of how anger became the dominant emotion in our politics and personal lives. And we were talking before the show began. I think we've lost Paris. We're going to try to get her back. What happened? We're, we're getting her back. <laughs> Just as I said. <laughs> we lost her. We're trying to get her back. But I And we were talking before the show. Poor Paris has to, for the nature of her work at Wired is to visit Twitter regularly, even 4chan and, and, and all the other uh, pockets of rage on the uh, on the Internet. It really does feel like we're more angry these days. And is it, I also feel like it's somewhat because we've been given tools. Anger has been weaponized by places like Twitter. You like Twitter, though. You're not a... I, I acknowledge all of Twitter's problems and have written about a lot of them. My own little bubble within Twitter is, is a pleasant place to be, and it's, it's not something I do grudgingly. Yeah. I totally you like it, but you're in a bubble, you admit. Yes, yes. I, to I totally acknowledge yeah. okay. The fact that I like Twitter does not mean that everybody likes Twitter or even can like Twitter. Um... It's, you know, it's, it's like any other medium. It's very complex, and it, it depends on how you intersect with it and who you're talking to and the topics you talk about and who people who you are and who people perceive you to be. Paris, we were uh, when you were gone, I'm glad we got you back, we were talking about uh, Duhigg's other article in this month in The Atlantic about the real roots of American rage and how angry everybody is. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mentioned that you have to live in the cesspools of anger. Uh, on the internet uh, as yep, part of your, every day as, it's um <laughs> on twitter reddit vote gab 4chan it's the you hang out on really gab old. too you gotta um i mean i tried to hang out there i have a couple of tools that monitor gab for a couple of key words but i think a large part about writing about online extremism is just keeping tabs in a variety of different parts of the internet and generally the worst parts of the is internet it, is it your sense that it's worse today than it's been or is this is it that i mean i think that it's th that's a hard question and i think it's because when we say worse we can see worse things more easily but i think that these bad things have always yes. been there or these awful conversations and this hate has always existed it's just now that because of uh, the proliferation of social media and the ease of access we have to all these different mediums, these sort of groups and hateful they ha the hateful rhetoric that they spouse, they are much more high profile and you can access them uh, by just searching. I think if you yeah, go I've back to news groups in the 80s or 90s, oh, you, will yeah. you will find parallels, but a tiny percentage of the people in the world were in news groups. They weren't, they weren't the least bit mainstream. Um, and yeah, therefore, exactly. therefore people weren't aware of it and it did not become national news stories and the president of the United States wasn't diving in to it in the way that happens today. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't even consider the, the president element, but I, I think, yeah, without a doubt, uh, it's easier to broadcast these ideas. I think it's easier to recruit, um, you know, vulnerable members of society to some of these causes. Um, I think there are more, you know, it's spilling over into the real world now. So, cons you know, people are acting on these conspiracies such as Pizzagate or, you know, there, there are probably other better examples. But uh, but to me, QAnon. it seems... Yeah, QAnon. I think that uh, I think you know, without a doubt, the, the the hate is rising in America. I think that it's more uh, it's more accepted than it's been, at least in my lifetime. Uh, Here's my and, theory. I want to try this out on you all. Uh, you know, they uh, uh, when you go, uh, there's signs on bridges in some bridges in this country that when you when when troops are marched across bridges to break step, not to march in lockstep, because their step will resonate and actually cause the bridge to get more and more resonate and break it. Whereas if they don't wow. march in lockstep, uh, there's no resonance created. 
My theory is that anger, and Duhigg talks about this in his Atlantic, Atlantic article, anger is self-reinforcing. It's not something that, there are things you can do that get it out of your system and then it goes away, but anger and revenge create a, a, a vicious circle that they amplify themselves. And that's always been the case. But what I'm, my theory is that there's a resonating frequency that Twitter and Facebook and to a lesser degree, because they're lesser used gab and places like that, are acting as a resonating agent. They're, they're, they're getting it to amplify to the breaking point. And so it's not that the anger hasn't always existed. It's that there are now in our society things that are amplifying it to the point where it's actually it's becoming a more and more rapid cycle of anger, right? Isn't that what you see on Twitter? I mean, social media amplifies everything. And actually, social media often amplifies things in a positive way. I think people just don't pay quite as much attention to it because it's nothing to worry about. Um, and arguably, it can, it can amplify lies and hate more powerfully than it amplifies the we, stuff. But the problem is we're uh, attracted to this, right? And so, so systems like Facebook that are uh, engineered to reinforce that behavior, to increase engagement, are automatically reinforcing it. Because that's yeah, what I mean, because engages people you. People stay on longer if they think that they're among a group of people that think just like them. And that's been one thing say, that I have. Why doesn't somebody do a happy news uh, site or a happy news newspaper? Because no one will read it. Because no one would read it. Because that's not people what. People love to be outraged. People love to be outraged. People love to be furious. People, and it, I think, stems because they like feeling like they're part of this kind of in-group. That's one thing that I've noticed when I've been studying, I guess, online conspiracies and online extremism is that the ones that uh, stay around for the longest seem to share the same um, note that their adherents have this sense of community. It's them against the world or some other group. Yes. Um, I guess in the case of Q QAnon, why I think that it has uh, existed for almost a year now, uh, or I guess over a year now, is that it, the, the in -group. base factor of it is that, okay, everybody out in the world is yeah. foolish. They don't understand. They don't it. It's the we deep it. state. We are the only ones yeah. that are knowledgeable yeah. and we are the smart ones. And All conspiracy putting theories yourself, do yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why that um, they continue to stay around. That's why also when it comes to these sort of hate groups, it's an in-group, out-group thing. Yeah. And these social media platforms reward that primal part in our brain that wants to constantly be engaged in a war for all eternity, you know, a war between us and others. It's way more exciting than real life if you are existing in this fake fantasy world that's constantly got you amped up, where you're constantly uh, fighting against deep, shadowy, deep state forces or against uh, some other race that you think is inferior and trying to take away your rights in the case of, I guess, white supremacist groups, and things like that. Uh, these platforms are built to... Uh, pry into our deepest so, urges. And so is there them. something we should do about this? I mean, I don't think we should shut down Twitter and Facebook. Should should Facebook take response? See, Facebook's not going to put good news in the news feed because that's not their business. Well, they sort of have moved a, a tiny bit in that direction because they said they're going to put less news in your news feed. More local. And give, and, well, and give you more stuff from your friends and family, yeah. which yeah. could be awful. But at least there's a decent chance it's, it's But you not know what the, the side effect of, of that was is in that announcement, um, I think Mark Zuckerberg or whoever it was that wrote the press release when they said they're going to de-emphasize local news, they said instead we're going to uh, promote, yeah, like you said, posts from your family, friends, but also things in groups. And do you know what since January when they made this announcement has become one of the hottest places for disinformation and extremism? Facebook groups. Yeah. That's we, where the Guillaume protests yeah. in France we talked about this last week. This is a perfect example. I, I know French people are always angry, right? I mean, there's, <laughs> there's a multi-hundred, multi-century history of barricades and riots. In fact, the, And there are some genuine points to the Gaijin protest, but there's sure. also a large part of it that has origin, arisen just from unbridled rage, conspiracy theories that has come out of these Facebook groups with hundreds of thousands. One of them even has over a million members. Yeah, and they're local because they're all by Departement. But the, th yep. the, th the thing I find interesting is uh, this is always – so this is – actually, France is probably a really good test tube for this because they've always had protests. 
The grand boulevards of Paris were designed so they couldn't be barricaded. That's why there's boulevards. That's why Hausmann built the boulevards is so that they could easily unbarricade them and troops could march in and break up the protests. Uh, but, I mean, if you've ever seen Les Miserables, you know. I mean, this is this is a long-standing history. But what's unique about the, uh, the Yellow Jacket uh, protests is that if you ask somebody, they can't really pinpoint the reason for their anger. It's like a lot, it's like it's a generalized upset. Yeah, it's an amorphous kind of ball of rage. It ostensibly began because it was tied to the gas type tax hike that was supposed to come in January. But then Macron said, okay, we're doing away with that or at least going to suspend it for six months. And then two days later, <laughs> France had the biggest protest it's had ever uh, related to these the Guillaume and yellow vests, and it has continued to spiral. I, I wonder. I just if if there. I don't know how you would fix this uh, because it is a human tendency, and social networks and the internet in general reflect humans, good and bad. We know that. I don't know if you. I don't. Is, does it need a fix? Does it need a cure? Maybe the, I always thought when and, and Harry and I are of the era where we were very optimistic in the '90s about the internet. The internet was going to change the world for the good because it was friction-free commerce. People would be able to express themselves. No more gatekeepers. It was a democratizing medium. Uh, and one of the things I said is sunlight is the best disinfectant. That, yes, there are hate groups, and they're hidden, and they're under rocks. And so the internet's going to give these kit, draw these people out in the open, and then sunlight would disinfect that we would all recognize. Maybe that's what's going on maybe now, right? Maybe we've all as a society, maybe we're just seeing the snakes and vipers under the rocks and saying, oh, that's horrible. And maybe now over the next decade or two, things will get better. Is that possible? Well, I think yes I think and no. Okay, Paris first yeah. and then Michael. Let's do Paris first. <laughs> sure. Okay, I, I mean, sunlight disinfects, yes. And there are a lot of cases where... Yes, you want to expose these sort of ills, but also sunlight amplifies and giving a spotlight to something exposes it to more people. And while this is one thing I've been thinking about a bit as this year is finished, we've gotten so much better as society, as journalists, as platforms at identifying disinformation or extremism. And uh, but we haven't figured out yet how to identify it and deal with it in a way that doesn't unduly amplify it or unduly show it to other people. Because, you know, if there's a large trend, I think, in the industry of tech journalism or internet journalism, whatever you want to call it, of people going through 4chan or some awful part of the internet and finding a bunch of, I don't know, let's say Nazis doing terrible Nazi things or crazy conspiracy theorists and screenshotting it, tweeting it out or writing a story about it. And while readers or viewers will be like, wow, that's crazy or laugh at it. There's also a large sect of other people who see it and go, Hmm, what is this QAnon thing? Let me Google it. And then end up falling into the rabbit hole themselves or same with other extremist beliefs. We have to find the middle line somewhere between, uh, disinfecting and, uh, overexposing michael um so i guess i think about this in slightly different terms i guess it, for me it's all about the click-based economy and how twitter and facebook basically uh you know encouraged a lot of different companies to to grow over the course of five to, to ten years so i think that uh that right now the issue is that if you see a post on on the facebook news feed from the New York Times, and then you see another one from something called the Denver Guardian, which was a domain that was once registered by uh, Russian operatives, uh, then the layman person or the average person cannot tell the difference between the New York Times article and that Denver Guardian article. They don't understand why one is more credible than the other. There's you know, inherent literacy problems in the US um, and, and frankly, just education problems. Uh, and so I think people, because Facebook treats those links uh, equally, People are reading this type of information and and thinking that uh, that it looks the same as something that's legitimate and therefore it must be there must be some truth to it and and a lot of people have a hard time discerning what's fake from what's real. Obviously, well, we don't want to go back um, to gatekeepers and say, well, the only real news is from the media centers of the country, L.A. and New York, and everything else is uh, fake news. Denver, what could possibly good come out of Denver, or your well, blog? Or Mashable, yeah. or yeah, 
Right. Well, so so, so we don't want to go back to those days where there were a handful of media, or do we? I think that the invisible hand will solve this problem and that ultimately you're going to have to pay money for good information. Oh. And these these websites that, that you know, uh, this is maybe a little bit weird for someone that's working at Mashable to say, but a lot of these new media companies that deliver free information – uh, will likely be less trusted over the course of time. There are definitely some exceptions to the rule. I think the, the larger publishers that um, that have a history of breaking news and having good information may continue to live on, but there are dozens and dozens of websites uh, that have millions of followers on Facebook that uh, that that exist through clicks right now. And I yeah. think that that will matter less in the future. I think that you know, the people I, I vote with my dollars, so I pay for a subscription to Wired, to Ars Technica, to the New York Times, yes. to the Washington Post, uh, to the information. So it can uh, it, not in the sense of a traditional gatekeeper, but I reward the ones that I think are quality because I know it costs money to make good journalism. Maybe that's what we yeah. need to do. Well, yeah, and the people that really care about news typically subscribe to you know to, to We're a minority, at least though. one or or multiple. Um, publishers. So I think, and, and that's been the case for a very long time in history. I think that will, you know, free free news is going away from from what I can tell. I don't think that uh, the click based economy will continue to exist. And I think the news feed will change to reflect that ultimately. Uh, but right now, the issue is that Facebook is is presenting this information in the same exact way. A New York Times article looks the exact same as something that. Uh, is written on on some random blog that has been quickly created by a Russian operative. And so that allowed for misinformation to spread. It continues to this day. And I think ultimately people will realize, as used to be the case, you know, when I was when I was growing up in the 90s on AOL, uh, you can't trust everything on the Internet. And so people will that will become the presiding mantra of the news feed. You can't trust everything on, on Facebook. And so ultimately the people that want good information are going to pay for uh, subscriptions to the Times or the Washington Post or Journal or inf or the Information or Wired Magazine or uh, or I think a lot of the these digitally native uh, new media publishers will also slowly move behind a paywall and and ask for you know there will be a premium version of these services that um, that give people more insight or uh, or or more information so so ultimately if you want good info you're going to have to pay for it and I, I think that's basically the case right now you know I think if you talk to people that are making decisions based on the news like a someone that works at a hedge fund or on Wall Street uh, they're they subscribed pay for to their a lot information of, yeah they absolutely they, that's they, why you can get a, a, 150 bucks a year for the Wall Street Journal because it makes you money. That's why Mr. Bloomberg is a billionaire. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly yeah. right. I mean, I've, uh, I've, and I've, you, you've been in publishing for ages. I mean, you've, you've seen the ups and downs of this, Harry. The, yes, but the ups lasted a long time, and, and the downward slope <laughs> has lasted for a long time. It's been a quick uh, down, though, and, i got to say. I, am, I mean, I, I do feel like the people who are willing to pay for information, are ready or, are, they're already pretty savvy consumers right. of information by right. definition. And a tiny uh, minority. Right, and a tiny minority. And it, it, I'm a little scared that the masses will have even less access to good information if everything goes behind a paywall. I, That's I, a very good point. We, one of the reasons are we're free, mm -hmm. and it was Mike Elgin who uh, catalyzed this for me, uh, is to, for democratic reasons. I want everybody to get the information that we offer. So we do advertise. I've always done advertising-supported media. I don't know what the future for advertising-supported media is, Uh because the problem, and I'll tell you why it's hard for advertising supported media, Google and Facebook, is uh, if, if you are an advertiser and you can get the kind of granular information Facebook and Google offers about your ad buy, and it's very efficient, it just makes it much less interesting to buy media. And I think that we're already seeing a flight of dollars from media into Google and Facebook, and they're eating it all up. And this is something really, I mean, this is inside baseball, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. This is a cause for concern because um, what that means is is our, the economics of it are incentivizing privacy invasion, surveillance capitalism, if you will, and, and de-incentivizing reporting and information services. And the flight of dollars to Google started like 15 years ago. So yeah. uh, it's accelerated. And uh, we're lucky we have a good advertiser base. But I worry. I really do. Because, hey, you know, you can get Facebook cheap. I am. I mean, looking for reasons for optimism, at least the Facebooks and the YouTubes of the world are acknowledging they bear some responsibility, which pretty much was not true 
a couple of years ago. Not that they're going to they're going to change. Uh, they're not going to change their medium or their model. No, <laughs> no, but they are doing things like uh, deplatforming people like Alex Jones, which actually, yeah, if helpful. Alex Jones has more trouble reaching the masses, yeah, that's helpful. It's actually harder for him to cause but, pain for people. And Paris, I think you worry about this too. I worry about these big companies deciding what's good and what's not good, what's wholesome and what's not wholesome, which people should hear and what they shouldn't hear. We can probably all agree that, in, not all, but many of us can agree that InfoWars is not a good source. But I don't know if I want Google to decide what what news I should get. Do you think? Yeah, and I think it stems from the fact that when we're talking about the Facebooks and Googles of the world, we view them not as companies with their own judgment and rules and editorial control baked into their terms of service since their beginning, but as essential kind of interfaces of the internet, essential components of and parts of how we see the world and view and experience information. And when it gets to a size, a, a, something of that size, all of the questions and answers become much more difficult to even sort out because, okay, yes, it is, I think it's good that Places like Facebook or YouTube have deplatformed someone like Alex Jones or yeah, we can all agree to, to that. spread that. We can agree <laughs> on that. But it's also like when you give agree that these companies should have that power, what stops them exactly. from deplatforming someone else yeah. or doing something in error or creating new rules about what sort of content they think is acceptable or not? And people who love Alex Jones feel totally disenfranchised by that. Of course, Sundar Pichai, yeah. the CEO of Google, was called on the carpet in Washington, D.C. this week. Spoke to Congress. <laughs> Zoe Lofgren, who is his, I think his member of Congress, said, "What she's using, she was using this as a, a, a faux example. Why is it that when people search for idiot, pictures of Donald Trump show up? <laughs> and Pachai said, well, but that's us not editorializing. If you wanted us to stop that, we would have to editorialize. I think um, just before I we hopped on this call, I was looking at, the conspiracy theory subreddit on Reddit, uh, just as one does for work. And the big topic of the day there was the fact that if you Googled it, if you entered in Google Hillary Clinton EM, like as if it, as you're supposed to type like emails, yeah. no results related to Hillary Clinton emails will pop up in the suggested search bar. But if you enter the same into all the other search uh, engines, then email related things will happen but it, then somebody in the comments points it out if you do the same with donald trump are you nothing related to russia pops up in the suggestions and it's because google is trying to walk this line yeah. between uh showing the content that people are actually searching for and the things that are actually happening but and that's troubling not offending because people if google were just doing search results unedited I think Hillary Clinton EM should turn up more than emoji and employment, which is all I get. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, that's all you get. Yeah. And, so uh, that's editorializing. It is editorializing. Autocomplete is, is totally cleaned up. And, and They've taken out all the, Google, all the stuff. Google has acknowledged yeah, that it takes some of then, the unpleasant stuff out of autocomplete. Yeah. Because people yeah, have I think it's so many stories about what if, like, when if you search black people, then it'll pull up yeah. black people in some racial slur. They were getting gorilla pictures of gorillas, sort of and so they made it impossible to search for gorillas or black people. Uh, that yeah. I understand. But this is the problem, is if you're a search engine, in theory, you, without bias, reflect the state of the internet. Which is biased. Which is biased. Mm -hmm. That's why you get idiot. Um... But on the other hand, do we want Google to decide what's true and what's not? They wield a huge amount of power. If it's, well, well, they, if it's they it, already it, are. The though. internet is Google for, in most cases, at least, uh, you know, people use Google. Yeah, I think that the idea that there is now becoming some editorializing uh, or that there's some editorial procedure from places like Google and Facebook is just a little bit silly because they've always been editorializing. Uh, I think in my, you know, the thing that I've sort of advocated for is algorithmic transparency. I think people deserve to understand why they're seeing things in the news feed, why they're seeing things in Google search. Uh, and that would that would that would, uh, I guess, resolve some of the anxiety around this. But but, you know, but. The reality is that even before deplatforming, even before a lot of this stuff, Facebook was already algorithmically 
demoting and prioritizing yes. certain bits of information. So, yes. you know, in, in the case of some of the reporting I did in 2016, we found that they were giving uh, preferential treatment to 10 publishers, 10 national news publishers. So the example that I often use is uh, is in the case of the Laquan McDonald shooting. There was a famous shooting in Chicago. It became national news. If the Chicago Tribune or if WGN or if the Chicago Sun-Times, all award-winning um, uh, publishers, if any of those publishers covered that shooting and broke news on that scandal it wasn't allowed to show up in the trending news feed oh. because it hadn't it hadn't been covered by one of 10 oh. of these national publishers which included the wall the wall street journal new york times cnn and uh, a lot of east coast um uh, east coast entities and so the reason why i was interested in that was because i grew up in chicago i expected to work at the chicago tribune my entire life and i i saw this as part of the reason why local publishers were dying. Places like the Baltimore Sun, the Denver Post, the Chicago Tribune. There's so many good uh, city newspapers across the country that have had advertising dollars taken from them and be, uh, because fa because of Facebook's uh, machine, because of the way that Facebook runs its its business. And, uh, and so in my opinion, it sort of led to the death of a lot of these newspapers and publishers because they were never allowed to be featured in this in this trending news feed. And uh, and and so, and so Facebook was giving preferential treatment to these publishers. I think uh, the 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 bigger you know I don't think it's wrong for Facebook to have made that decision, but they didn't disclose it, right? They weren't upfront with the fact that unless things reached one of these ten publishers, it would not be allowed to trend. And but so that's just one example. These decisions are constant. They're being made all the time. They exactly can't be right transparent now. because they're algorithmic. Uh, we see all the time people saying, look at uh, artificial intelligence is being t mistrained. It can't identify people of color because it's all trained on white people. And so it's got a huge false positive rate in, among black people. It, I mean, I, you go, you could, it's an endless story. This is the nature of the world we live in. Is it just, though, that it's always been the nature of the world we live in and we just now can see it? Or that's my, that's the fundamental question for this whole segment, which we're going to wrap soon, is. Is this unusual? Is this something new? Or is this just we know about it now because of better I think the, there's this idea that there's this some sort of neutral platform that we're doesn't supposed exist. to return back to. It doesn't exist. There was never did. I think it's because yeah. these social media companies and tech companies from Silicon Valley especially – uh, kind of pride themselves in the early days on the free and open internet and being pro-free speech, whatever that meant, but being kind of a technological digital version of the public square when in reality they're as far from that as possible. And so people are trying to return back to some unrealistic, as, as, impossible it's ideal. It's nostalgia. It's, the, it's, a, yeah. it's a lie. It's all a lie. It was never well, that good. Nostalgia's a lie. Is the, <laughs> it's all yeah, a lie. It was the never only answer good. for here. I mean, the old gatekeeper is also at a million problems, They too. were worse. They and, were, and they were less transparent. I would not go back to that era even if we could. Yeah. You worked at Newsweek. Yeah. You worked at a, a, Time. a Time, I'm sorry, a great news magazine that's had its ups and downs right. and uh, right in parallel with all of this, you know, and they're having, some, they're having an up right now, now that Mark Benioff owns yes. them. He's he act, bought them. He's yeah. actually willing to invest in Time, which Time Warner was not when I was there. That's still a weird model where people like Jeff Bezos buys the Washington Post or Benioff buys Time Magazine. It's the it's the patronage model. We're going back to Venice in the 16th right. century, where the rich people decided what media outlets exist purely because they're willing to spend lose money on them. I don't know if that's a good model either. I don't know what. Yep. It's it's yep. hard to say. There's a uh, there's somebody in the chat room. Uh, I presume Native Geek is a Native American. He or she writes the protests in North Dakota over the XL uh, the Keystone Pipeline uh, went on for months before anybody paid attention. Facebook was pivotal in getting Native Americans from across the country to protest that pipeline. So that's, I mean, you can, for every negative, there's also a positive counterexample for all of this. So it's very difficult to say what the right thing to do is. is uh, all, I, all I think we ever do here, it's a little frustrating to me, is observe. And we never, we've not yet come up with a solution, <laughs> try as we might. Uh, let's take a little bit uh, of a break. Michael Nunez is here for Mashable. It's great to have you, Deputy Tech Editor. We're going to talk some tech Actually, I'm going to let you get prepared because we're going to talk about that super micro story. There's new news. Also, Paris Martineau, she's at Wired. Staff writer there does, if you get a chance, just search her byline on Wired. Great story after great story. You're really doing a fantastic Thanks. job. 
And speaking of great stories, he's the original technologizer, Harry McCracken, technology editor at Fast Company. Our show today brought to you by Avnet. You may not know the name. I bet you do, actually. A-V-N-E-T. They make great electronic components. Mm -hmm. But they want to tell, this is, I'm really happy to do this for the holiday season. And I want to thank Avnet for doing this. A happy story to make you feel better about the world. How does a groundbreaking technology incubator debut its latest idea for solving life's absurdities by leveraging an end-to-end -end ecosystem that turns ideas into marketable products? There's a, a company called Not Impossible Labs. No, I love the name, Not Impossible Labs. They had an idea for a technology that could change live music. They wanted to bring the experience of a concert to a group of people who traditionally couldn't enjoy it, the deaf community. I mean, we, we love live music, and we take it for granted. It's an amazing experience. Touches, and this is important, all the senses. So the challenge lies in making concerts and live music more in, uh, inclusive for the deaf. So with Avnet as their guide, Not Impossible Labs, their idea evolved to one of the most sophisticated wearables on the market, helping bring a shared live concert experience to some great people. And you can see this. If you go to the website, A-V-N-E-T, avnet.com slash music one. That's music in the number one. It's called Music Not Impossible. The product allows deaf and hearing concert goers alike to literally feel live music through advanced vibration technology and then experience it together for the first time. And dance, baby. These wearables are truly wearables. It's a vest. Components that said vibrations through the ankles, wrists, and chest. The, the hearing able to receive music vibrations through the ears, but attendees who are deaf and wearing these wearables got the same vibrations throughout other parts of the body, allowing many of them to respond to live music alongside everybody else. For many people, this is so cool. It was a first for them, an innovation that literally opened a whole new world of music exploration for those who don't hear it in a traditional sense. Avnet and Not Impossible Labs revealed music not impossible at the Life is Beautiful Music Festival in Las Vegas. It was a big hit. This kind of innovation was brought to the finish line because of Avnet. And instead of, on this holiday season, instead of Avnet touting their wares and they do great stuff, they thought it'd be great if you could just share this story. Feel the rhythm at avnet.com slash music one. A-V-N-E-T dot com slash music and the number one. It's a great holiday story. We thank Avnet for their support and for. I think this is really cool. I don't think we've ever had an advertiser do this, and I thank you, Avnet. Instead of flogging their wares, which I would be happy to flog because they're good wares, they decided <laughs> to talk about some good that uh, has happened in the world. See, doesn't that make us feel better now? Super micro. We go back a few months to the Bloomberg story, which was a conundrum to everybody. And actually, I defended Bloomberg because I think Bloomberg's a great journalistic organization. I know people who know the two authors of the Super Micro story. The editor in chief who was supervised that story over a long period of time uh, has great credentials, came from The Economist, really knows his stuff. I couldn't think of any way that 17, wasn't it 17 anonymous sources? that uh, Bloomberg Business Week could have gotten this wrong. The big hack cover story on Bloomberg, how China used a tiny chip to infiltrate U.S. companies. Well, we always thought, well, if this is true, there'll be evidence. Somehow we'll find out. Well, Supermicro uh, went out and asked for an audit. They went to a, a company uh, that specializes in going through this kind of stuff, Nardello and company. Nardello specifically tested samples of the motherboards supplied to, as as in the Bloomberg story, Apple and Amazon. It remembers Amazon's Elemental, uh, Apple servers that supposedly had this rice-sized chip that was phoning home, phoning the Chinese government. Nardello tested older motherboards alongside current versions, and according to Supermicro, found no evidence of spy chips on any of them. The company also checked design files and software to see if there was evidence of tampering with either, but found nothing there either. Now, you remember that the U.S. intelligence community, Apple, Amazon, strongly denied the story. Tim Cook asked for a retraction. Bloomberg has stood by this story all this time. Supermicro now says they're reviewing their legal options. What do you make of this one? <laughs> mm. 
this is the other shoe. Now I'm going to have to step back and say, how did this happen? How could Bloomberg get this so wrong? Harry? Well, um, and uh, Bloomberg reported on this audit and had to say that Bloomberg has said in the past it stands by its story. But I don't believe Bloomberg has really responded to this audit specifically. No, I mean, it came out Wednesday, so they, it's, you know, I mean, they, they're probably thinking about what they're going to say. Uh, and Bloomberg hasn't had all that much to say about its story other than it stands by it. And I've seen little evidence that anybody else who's looked at this has concluded that, that Bloomberg is probably right. So I think it's a challenge for people like us to form opinions on this just because at least I'm not an expert on this stuff. And I, I want to be careful ab about uh, being positive. I know who's right here. Yeah. But you. Well, what you are an expert on is the editorial process. True. And from everything I know, which mostly comes from uh, movies. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I saw The Post. Uh, <laughs> That's it. You're, you're a journalist. I'm, a, I'm an expert. Uh, all the president's men. I saw that. Uh, remember in 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 the during Watergate, all the presidents men, men and and Woodward and Bernstein, they had two. First of all, uh, their uh, editor in chief said, "Look, you're going to have to have two stories for every two sources for everything." Uh, you know, they vetted everything. You got to be sure this can't. Let me see your notebooks. Seventeen sources in this story, and presumably Bloomberg was doing exactly the same thing. Yes, and when you were reporting on something so explosive, the bar goes up even higher. And Bloomberg is not a like some newfangled, funky blog. Right. It's extremely old school in a yes. good way. So, we, so this is why it's a puzzle. Here's my theory. Paris, and I'll, I'll let you and Michael jump in anytime you want. But my theory is that Bloomberg got, Bloomberg Business Week got played. That's, that somebody in the, there has been, and we'll talk about some of the other stories too a concerted drumbeat against china and i would if you want to interpret this as a blow to the supply chain as a blow to the security of the supply chain that del that originates most of it in china and we know the the u.s government particularly the administration is not a fan of trade with china you can almost put together a scenario where 17 intelligence officials cons in a concerted fashion now, of course, Bloomberg said there were also people from Amazon and Apple involved in this. But anyway, in a concerted fashion, lied to Bloomberg Business Week, tricked them into publishing this story because it served their political agenda. Is that possible? Uh, I'll go first here because <laughs> I, 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 you know, people have have said similar things about stories that I've written. I think that uh, when you have seventeen people. Uh, confirming a lot of this the same information i don't know that all 17 confirmed that this this bug was implanted but certainly there was an issue around this right i, I think that seems to me it seems pretty pretty I, i'm pretty certain of that um i think you know what i'm sort of watching before I, I think harry makes a great point you know it's hard to say anything definitively i think that if there's a lawsuit brought against Bloomberg, that will bring the truth out. And if there isn't, I think that also suggests that Bloomberg got the story right. So oh. for me, I'm kind of using the the legal case as uh, as like the litmus test for the validity of this article. Because if they absolutely, if they misreported the facts, if they got everything wrong, then there should be a pretty easy case to make uh, legally against Bloomberg from, from all of the companies mentioned in that story. Uh, however, if Bloomberg is even somewhat true uh, the reporting is somewhat true uh then i think that uh that a lot of these companies will have a hard time making a case against bloomberg and so if no lawsuit comes of this then i think it suggests that there is a lot of truth in the reporting that oh, that's interesting. Uh, from from that story so so for me that's kind of the barometer i guess so there's a third shoe i don't know why but there's a third shoe that's gonna have to drop and that's a lawsuit Paris, what yeah, do you I think? totally agree. I mean, I think that I've been following this as well and been kind of perplexed as well as silent on it in a bit because generally from an outlet like Bloomberg and the two great reporters that co bylined this, 17 sources, a story of this magnitude, especially one that was in print, it doesn't seem likely that uh, all the different layers of fact checking and legal and editorial work that went into this would have ended up. Uh, misrepresenting the truth in an egregious fashion. Um, but also all these companies have been so uh, defiant about this, have, uh, but 
I think the, like Michael said, the one thing that we will uh, have to see is whether or not a legal case is brought because, okay, if what Apple and Supermicro and whatnot are saying is true, if the Bloomberg story has no merit, then it's a pretty easy lawsuit uh, because the only defense is that it's true. So if they can prove that it's not in some way, um, I don't see why they wouldn't have already brought a lawsuit or if why they had just called for a retraction uh, rather than something uh, stronger. Is but Bloomberg we, I don't Business... Think we, I don't think we have enough facts to judge it as outsiders. Right. Is Bloomberg Business Week hampered in their defense, though, in a lawsuit because these 17 sources are, are anonymous? And, and by the way... I, I, uh, you, you're all reporters. You know, the, the, oftentimes anonymous sources, just as at, in Watergate, are critical to a story. Doesn't mm -hmm. an, an, anonymity alone is not does not impeach them. Uh, but that's not part, at all. that's partly because of a strong editorial process that backs it up. It, but it's appropriate for reporters to keep those sources anonymous. You can understand why in a national defense story that would be uh, not un, un, not surprising. But does it hamper their legal case? Is it hard for them to go defend themselves in court if they could say, well, we can't tell you who said this? Well, it shouldn't matter. Uh, you know, so it, it, I've, I've used anonymous sources and uh, and have been accused of, of, of similar things, of being tricked into telling a story that wasn't true, but which is which is wrong. I think that uh, there the the source doesn't matter. It's the it's the material that they present to you. So as long as Bloomberg has enough material to to show that 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 the claims made in the story are true. So it could be emails, it could be internal documents, could be photos of the server, uh, any of those things, uh, then, it then it ultimately doesn't matter who delivered that information. Um, but but I would add one small caveat to this, which is I think that, uh, you know, this this culture of non-disclosures has, has really caused a, a lot more anonymous sourcing than, um, than, than, than I would prefer, really, especially in the case of like technology news. Uh, you know, so at all of these big companies, these employees have to sign non-disclosure agreements when they walk into the building. And so they're often not able to talk about their experience, even if they want to on the record. So in, in many cases, when you see an anonymous source in a story, they're often legally hampered from, from revealing their name. And so at least in, 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 in my experience, there have been people that, that have said, like, I would love to come forward. I just don't want to be sued or, or have any legal retribution um, pursued from a company like Facebook or, or um, something like that. So I think um, what irritates me is that these non-disclosures seem uh, antithetical to the First Amendment. You know, it seems yeah, like almost yeah. unconstitutional. They're, you're, you're muzzling you're, well, uh, citizens. You're, you're if muzzling you're a whistleblower, people. you're protected, right? Although, remember, Edward Snowden did not have enough confidence in whistleblower regulations to... Uh, to uh, trust the military, he got out of the country <laughs> as fast as he could. So yeah, I think in in, in many cases, um, I wouldn't trust it. I'll say that if I was yeah. a if I was a whistleblower, I would not trust those protections because I think there are plenty of examples where whistleblowers are ostracized and challenged and um, and, so and I mean, treated if you're really not legally challenged, then you can be blackballed by right. the industry. Right. I think a lot of times I will talk to people and they're like, okay, I can probably speak with you about this legally. My non-disclosure doesn't apply to this, but I don't want my name associated with an article on this topic because future employers will just happen to see my name when they Google it in an article about this and decide I'm not trustworthy or that I will leak to the press in the future. And it kind of creates this culture of silence, especially in the tech world. Does this... Okay, so, so I guess we'll just wait and see. <laughs> I'd love to see Bloomberg... Come up with a media response. They to, need to, to do something to all the the flack they've caught, which they it, have not really done. It may be the case that there were it wasn't a widespread hack. That there were a handful of boards, which would actually make sense. You're going to target if you're the Chinese government. You're doing industrial espionage or military espionage because some of these boards, by the way, the Amazon Elemental boards were used by the Department of Defense for during uh, drone strikes, things like that. So if you're going to do that, you're going to target them. You're going to say this board's going to. Uh, the Department of Defense, let's put it on that one. So it doesn't, to me, it doesn't disqualify the story because we haven't been able to produce a board that has that problem. It might be, there's six of them. And also, the underlying truth of the story is a given by everybody who knows anything about the supply chain. We do it to them, they do it to us. This, There's all kinds of stuff going on. Even the Snowden revelations had some hardware hacks that the NSA had perpetrated 
on other countries. So we know this goes on. So really, I think there's a much tougher question underlying it, which is what the hell do we do if we can't trust stuff made in China? Because that's have to where pay for things made not in China, which will be an expensive answer, I guess. It's a great article I read uh, today about Steve Jobs' futile attempt to make Apple computers in the United States. He tried like the Dickens. At first, he wanted to make Max. Remember, he, he was a that? great believer, and he built the, the Next factory. He did it with Max, uh -huh. and then with Next. And then Tim Cook comes along. It's no surprise as his successor. He's the chief operating officer. What is Tim Cook's expertise? Supply chain in Asia. And all the manufacturing moves offshore. That's how he became a CEO, because yep. he, was, he was great at that kind of stuff. Yep. So it doesn't seem likely that we're going to get off. We're hooked on that one. Well, GoPro is coming. Uh, is, That's right. GoPro is still going to manufacture in Asia, but not for stuff coming back to the U.S. because of the, the tariff situation. That's more tariffs, though, yeah, than, it's, uh, yeah, than it's worry not about. Yeah, it's a security thing. But the, apparently GoPro, which, you know, they're not ma making things in iPhone volume. They're making things in quite high volume. Uh, feels that it's capable of doing that. We shall see. It could be the end of the company. There uh, is, was an interesting um, twist to the Huawei case. I, 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 I'm think I'm going upstream when I'm saying this, but I, I worry that there's, there's that this Huawei story is not actually a tech technical issue or a defense story, but a political story. That is one more arm of this attempt to discredit China. President Trump has sort of more or less acknowledged it is. I, I think it sounds like he's talking about how they'll the roll it into the trade deal. Uh, Donald, you keep screwing up this. You gotta stop talking about this stuff. So Germany, now, by the way, U.S., Australia, uh, England, the f all five eyes are say we're not going to use Huawei gear in our Canada, in our uh, 5G networks. Germany says, no, <laughs> we're going to use Huawei gear. It can't, the Germany's technology watchdog says it can't find any evidence that Huawei is a security risk. Uh, the uh, Arnie Schoenbaum, who's the head of Germany, Germany's Federal Office for Information Security, told Der Spiegel, for such serious decisions like a ban, you need proof. We can't find any evidence. We examined all of Huawei's products in our lab. All three of German, Germany's major telcos use Huawei equipment. John Ledger of T-Mobile says we're going to be able to get regulatory approval for the T-Mobile Sprint merger because we promise not to use Huawei gear. Is this politics? Is this tech? Is this, what's going on? I mean, it could be a preemptive measure, right? I, I don't know, um, I, I don't know definitively, you know, wh why, um, why some of this stuff is happening, but it doesn't seem that far-fetched to me that, uh, that there would be interest from the Chinese government to use all of its resources, including one of its largest uh, electronics companies to uh, to further the the parties, the you know right. the, the ruling parties. Um, sure. And we know Huawei has tight connections to the Chinese military. It was founded by a former Chinese military officer. Um, so so I, that, that seems like an inherent it, it seems to me, to me you have to find the just with as with Supermicro, you got to find the bug. You got to find the the flaw. And I'm presuming that Germany has some pretty good technologists. They can't find anything wrong with it. So is this just a preemptive thing like, well, it could be? I mean, to me, it seems I'm okay with that that type of reasoning. I think, I mean, a, an all-out ban, so a countrywide ban is pretty pretty darn extreme. But I think it's okay for defense contractors to be prohibited from using equipment sure. made overseas. I, I, that seems very reasonable to me. Actually, it seems foolish not to do that, in, in my opinion. But uh, Yeah, but, especially because if you don't find something now, that doesn't mean that later something might come up. Uh, especially if, I guess, then a foreign entity knows it has easy access, an access channel into another country's uh, defense systems, then why wouldn't they in the future uh, perhaps take advantage of that? I think, Huawei, on their part, is offering yeah. uh, full access to their source code and hardware. They're proposing the establishment of a national cybersecurity evaluation center to test the security credentials of technologies being implemented into critical infrastructure products. They're trying to persuade Australia and others to, 
to start using Huawei gear. Canada's pulling a billion dollars worth of Huawei gear out of their network. A great cost. Uh, Huawei also uh, pitched U.S. lawmakers uh, saying, hey, look, we'll open it all up. It's a... Ah, we live in difficult times. <laughs> I'm counting yeah. on you guys. You, you, <laughs> you guys got to figure this out. <laughs> well, I mean, and so I guess, like, what's the cost to the average U.S. consumer? What's the cost to the even the U.S. economy? I, I don't, I don't see the incentive for like pushing this deal you through. You say, why I take guess the it, chance? Why take the chance? Yeah, I mean, I, I truly because Huawei don't is the understand. number one five G manufacturer in the world. So, if, I, if you want, if we want to roll out five G fast, and don't want to use the, Huawei gear, or maybe you don't want to use any Chinese gear. We ain't getting 5G. There's no one in the U.S. that makes 5G gear. They're the number that, two smartphone manufacturer yeah. in the world after Samsung. This is not some little tiny company. This is this is a huge global corporation. But 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 I mean, it, are they doing anything that a that a comp So you know, for example, I South would Korea say you have to find the evidence that they're doing something first before you accuse them of doing something. This, I just. I understand. It makes sense that they would do something. But didn't the U, didn't U.S. intelligence accuse Huawei of spying on U.S. citizens earlier this year, like in January or February? Uh, I, I thought that there was an intelligence report that said that Huawei was. Uh, I think Huawei and ZTE were guilty of spying on U.S. consumers, and uh, and there was like a a brief scare about this before before the ban came. Uh, there were a couple of warnings. There was the one warning from the U.S. Department of Commerce that ZTE and Huawei gear should not be used. Um, earlier this year, you might be talking about this, the U.S. intelligence community, including the heads of the FBI, CIA, and the NSA, said don't use Huawei phones. Chris Ray, the FBI director uh, at the time, said the government was deeply concerned about the risks of allowing any company or entity that is beholden to foreign governments that don't share our values to gain positions of power inside our telecommunications network. That's more like, well, we're worried. Yeah, so there, I guess there still wasn't any evidence. I think evidence that's reasonable concern, yeah. It seems totally I mean, fair. Okay. You don't have a moral <laughs> obligation to buy any piece of equipment from anybody in particular if, you're, if you find it to be an unsettling prospect. Yeah. Well, but now there's I think an it's better to be ban, right? Oh, sorry. The, yeah, the U.S. lawmakers have banned it. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean to cut you off, Paris. Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I was saying I think it's better in these situations to be proactive rather than reactive. Um, I think if the situation was reversed and that these companies or groups uh, went ahead with Huawei uh, technology and then a couple of years down the road we find out that some of it maybe, even if it was just a small part of it, was compromised in some way. We all would be up in arms over the fact that they ever let any of it in. And um, that in these sort of cases, we should allow intelligence organizations or uh, entities, whether they're governments or uh, specific mergers and companies, to decide what sort of channels they want to use and not use. I mean, the funny thing is that, like, isn't it true that... Uh that Russian intelligence had infiltrated, I, th I feel like I read this uh, earlier, like a couple of months ago, that Russian intelligence had infiltrated um, like energy companies or something like that. Like, wasn't it, isn't it true that, uh, basically my point here is that maybe there are greater risks than Huawei that are already, uh, that are already being, the, the vul vulnerabilities that are already being used and, 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 uh, and exposed, I guess. Oh, definitely. Um, so, so if you buy I mean, a Cisco, earlier... if you buy a Cisco switch, nice American company, it's made uh -huh. in China. Uh, if you're buying it in Russia, it'll be made in Russia, by the way, because the Russians aren't going to use the Chinese equipment. Uh, they shut down their Mexican plants. Uh, I would bet there's not much networking gear you could buy that's not made in China. Does this... I mean, prudence would dictate we shouldn't buy anything made in China, right? Uh, as, as, as just average citizens? Yeah, or the government, or to, yeah, because the I, telcos, I or I mean, yeah, I understand I, I the threat. Like you could not only have espionage, industrial and and surveillance. In fact, we're going to talk about that story in a second because apparently there's evidence the Chinese have had a long-standing program to do that. But there's also the threat of cyber warfare. They shut your networks down. So I understand the threat. I'm not saying that they're 
I mean, I think if we're talking about a perfect world where you'd want to be perfectly secure, of course, yeah, you would definitely want to be making everything in a controlled warehouse that only you have access to. Um, but of course, is that, that is not feasible. It's yeah. not practical. It's not something that's ever going to happen. Um, so companies and governmental entities are going to have to pick and choose where they uh, want to minimize risks. And as Mr. Jif, or is it Mr. Gif, points out in our <laughs> chat room, it's exactly what other countries go through when buying American gear. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Right. Uh, I hate. I, think, I would hate. I think. Look, I'm a lib. I'm a liberal, and I mean it in the traditional sense of liberty, free. I think the world is a better place when there's free trade, the, where borders go down, where people trust one another. Uh, and I would hate to see an illiberal world, which we're moving towards, where every country is, has a big barrier up against every other country and doesn't trust any other country. Because to me, that leads to world war. And uh, I don't think we can afford another world war. So that's my point of view. Maybe that's uh, that's a highly impractical point of view, but that's my point of view. I worry that this is a, the wrong direction to be going. I mean, I generally agree with that. I think that, and I, I bet most people on the panel agree that uh, you know, open borders and open and free trade is 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 generally regarded better. But obviously, like th there are no simple answers to this. I think that that one of the things that I tell my friends who didn't go to college who are often tricked by misinformation is that uh, that there are very rarely and this is also part of adulthood I think there are rarely simple answers to these very complicated questions and uh, and so you know although it would be great to just buy and sell from whoever you want ac across the world um, there's there's there are more social dynamics going on that that well frankly we probably don't 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 even fully understand and so um so i think it makes sense to me to to be as open as possible but if you're a government contractor or a government agency i think that it makes sense to source from a place like south korea which is a strong ally has one of the largest us army bases in the world etc uh, etc cetera, et cetera, uh, and has a strong history of supporting uh us uh priorities i guess versus some versus uh you know commissioning work from 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 a foreign agent whether it be china or russia or you know anywhere else in the world i think it's you know it's generally just safer to work with with allies right and with people that have historically supported um um us customs and us um um you know i guess international strategy or whatever you want to call it so um so to me i feel it feels like like it, I guess maybe I'm defending uh, something that I, I typically wouldn't defend, but it seems to me like there are plenty of reasonable alternatives, and and it's not I'm not saying we should you know we should um, completely shut down trade with China. That is that's not my stance, but it, but it seems okay to forbid government agencies from purchasing from this one supplier yeah. so long as there are viable alternatives uh, that allies can provide. And and my rough understanding is that South Korea. Um, does have a lot of manufacturing facilities that can do a lot of the things that Chinese suppliers can do. It's sometimes a little bit more costly, but um, but you know things like OLED screens and uh, and uh, and semiconductor um, manufacturing. You know that that stuff does take place in in countries that have long supported uh, U.S. Uh, political procedure, U.S. Uh, political stra geopolitical strategy. So um, so to me, if that's a if that's a viable option then we should absolutely choose that over um over an unknown i think it's just the most rational to me it's the most rational decision you know you have uh it's like the the devil you know versus the the, the devil you don't i guess or whatever that saying is <laughs> um i think that's better paranoid. i think know. a better decision would be to make it evidence-based i think it's it's the idea of the world being overly dependent on one company for 5g is unsettling but it is I mean, there's sony uh, and ericsson but yeah. they're a right. fraction uh, and, I'd, I'd I mean, much rather there be several choices based yeah. in several different countries. Yeah. And, and uh, I don't know, I feel like I would rather see this be evidence-based rather than say, well, they've got to be up to something, so we're just not going to buy this. So stuff. If, you, if you were the head of a large telecommunications company, would you buy Huawei equipment? Or? I think I would. But I would make sure we audited it heavily. But now, is that a false presumption? Is it impossible to audit this stuff? No, actually, maybe that's maybe that's the more reasonable solution here. Yeah, and Sorry. perhaps I assume that these companies are not doing this blindly. I assume that there's yeah. some sort of audit or well, investigation that we as the public are not hearing about. 
Yeah. Um, but that's my problem yeah. is there's this political thing that says, no, don't do it. Don't do it. And then there's, I think, a much more pragmatic, and uh, because I we don't make this stuff in the United States, there's a much more pragmatic point of view. I mean, sure, maybe we should build up our manufacturing capacity. But for right now, a more pragmatic thing to do would be buy it and audit it. And if it if it's clean, use it. But but how do you look for something? You know, I you guys know the the, the way that hackers work and the way that hackers think. How do you how do you search for something that that like how do you look for the thing that you that that uh, well, look what that, Huawei's done. I mean, think open sourcing their software is, and saying, "Look, here's a, we're going to be open about this." That's all they can do, right? And to me, that gives me some confidence that they are not, in fact, uh, doing up it, to something. It seems like there's a strong case that we haven't seen evidence of Huawei doing anything fishy, right? As of now, so now I'm worried that it's a political thing, and it's not in our best interest. But uh, again, I, who knows? I don't. Well, know. look at remember like Spectre and Meltdown though. I mean that that those were vulnerabilities that were Thank you, available Intel. that that were open <laughs> for years, right? right? And so and and how did those go missed? Is is you know was how well, I felt at the a, time. But there's a difference between a flaw and intentional backdoors and things like that. That's true, but I guess the uh, the you know the intelligence community looks for flaws that are unknown, right? And right. So, and. And you think maybe the Chinese put something in there knowing that down the road they'd be able to exploit it, but figuring we wouldn't discover it. Now, that's okay. So that answers that my question. Sense. Is it possible to yeah. say this is safe? And maybe it's not. And I mean, I think that but, would I mean, be the ultimate Trojan horse is present something that looks to be entirely safe. Uh, you have the open source software and whatnot, but you have somehow found a backdoor in that is hiding within that once it is deployed within the highest levels of U.S. government and the agencies of all of your entities, um, of your enemies, uh, then you exploit it. And I mean, I assume that these, I'm generally very skeptical of mo all government agencies, but I assume that making a decision like this that is going to affect their bottom line, um, they have to have some sort of reasoning behind it. And especially given the reports that we've gone over earlier and that we've seen over the past couple of years concerning Huawei and similar um, companies, that there's probably they're probably not just doing this for no apparent reason. Because for a lot of these companies or agencies purchasing technology from China, from one of the best manufacturers of 5G technology, as well as other uh different venues seems like the natural choice and would benefit them in numerous ways. Let's take a break. When we come back, uh, more evidence of Chinese hacking in the United States <laughs> and a long-term uh, problem. We'll also uh, talk about uh, new text message rules from the FCC uh, that could cause problems. Also, some good news in California. It looks like they're not going to tax your SMS messages. Uh, we'll talk about that. Lots more. Oh, and, an, oh, and another Facebook exploit. Yeah. Uh, our show today brought to you by, well, I can't decide, panko crusted chicken and maple dipping sauce with roasted Brussels sprouts and sweet potatoes. Or maybe you look to me like more like a creamy saffron risotto with Sicilian style roasted cauliflower. I do. <laughs> oh, you, well, I'll tell you what we made the other day that was amazing. Seared steaks and loaded mashed potatoes with roasted broccoli and guajillo honey sauce. Now that's a Harry McCracken. Sounds great. <laughs> We're talking about Blue Apron. Well, Blue Apron makes cooking fun and easy. It is awesome. Every Wednesday we get our Blue Apron box and we just look forward to it every week. What we do is we, and I'm talking we, me and Lisa, we go online, we look at the Blue Apron menus, lovely, lovely choices, a variety of diets, many vegetarian options, kid-friendly meals too. I'm always, that's why we did the seared steaks. Michael loves steak. Uh, with the holidays fast approaching, meal prep is the last thing you want to worry about. Shopping, planning. What if what if it was just like you go home and there's everything you made to do it, make it everything you need to make it a delicious, wholesome meal? That's what Blue Apron does. Create meals that are beautiful so beautiful you'll share them on social media. You can choose meals that are quick, 20 minutes, choose meals that take a little bit longer. I, I actually like to cook. I love it and since they've they, they they they've done all the work for me, I always you know, just pick by flavor, frankly. There are lots of videos and time-saving tips on the website. 
Blue Apron takes a chore out of meal prep. The website and mobile app make it easy to plan your meals every week. You don't have to ever worry about forgotten ingredients. I don't have to I've <laughs> run to the store because, oh, no, I need some sage. In fact, what's great is there's no waste either. You always get exactly what you need to make the dish, but no more. If you need one carrot, you get one carrot. Oh, and man, you're going to learn. To me, it's been a cooking school in a box. New techniques, new recipes, even new ingredients. I had no idea what guajillo honey sauce was or how it tasted until I made it. And let me tell you, it tastes delicious. Blue Apron. It's time. I know you've heard me talk about it before. I know your mouth is watering right now. Perhaps I could interest you in some Korean-style popcorn chicken with jasmine rice and roasted broccoli. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I want you to try it out. Get your first three meals free. Check out this week's menu at blueapron.com slash twit. Blue Apron. Oh, man, I'm so hungry now. Blueapron.com slash twit. Blue Apron's a better way to cook. We actually often do Blue Apron Sunday nights uh, because I work late, and what's nice to have a meal ready for me when I get home, and I just whip it up. So good. Facebook, a new Facebook bug. Well, they just never end. Facebook is the gift that just keeps on giving. This one... <laughs> It's another related bug to this whole API. Several, uh, Facebook made the announcement uh, after host, hosting a pop-up privacy experience in New York's Bryant Park. <laughs> oh, man, how did I miss that? Uh, they said, oh, oh, by the way, uh, several third-party apps had, quote, access to a broader set of photos than usual for 12 days in September. 6.8 million users, many photos which they had not posted that were private. There's the pop-up, the privacy, <laughs> Facebook privacy experience. It's probably gone by now. Um, when someone gives permission for an app to access their photos on Facebook, we usually only grant the app access to photos people share on their timeline. In this case, a bug potentially gave developers access to <coughs> other photos. A few apps, 1,500 apps. Oh, man. It uh, also let uh, those apps access photos posted in stories and marketplace and on the user's timeline. Uh, even photos you uploaded but didn't post. It'll be working with affected developers to help them delete the photos from impacted users. Oh, you go vault. Uh... I just tell you this as a warning. I'm not angry about it because I don't use Facebook anymore. I think one big lesson is look and see what apps have access to your Facebook. Yes, and take the and ones I, out. When I checked, I had 300, most of, <laughs> yeah. most of which wow. I couldn't remember ever having given them permission, and some of which didn't exist anymore. And you should grind it down to the ones where you know them, you know you, you want them to have access, and delete everything else. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I have kind of just given up on the idea of privacy at this point. I feel like as long as I have... <laughs> that's the other option. <laughs> I mean, truthfully, just there's, there's, there's no way to manage go. this anymore. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. I mean, the thing is I'm sharing a, a lot less, but I guess uh, as long as I have the Facebook app on my phone and as long as I'm sort of participating even as infrequently as I do, uh, I just assume that everything is everything could go public at any moment. Anything that I do on my phone, uh, any 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 browsing history, any, like, there's so much attached to my Facebook account that uh, that I've just kind of given up on the idea of privacy. The, I'll, the other thing I'll add to this is that, uh, you know, so I joined Facebook before photos were even a thing. This was in college. And uh, I remember photos arriving while I was in my freshman year of college. Wait a minute, you joined Facebook back when it was, like, just universities only? Yes, was it exactly. Was Facebook <sighs> at the time? <laughs> It, that's how Facebook. I access the website. Yeah, the, the Facebook. Oh uh, my God, and, uh, you're an old timer. It was it was awesome. I mean, again, you described this earlier. You know, people were really optimistic about these democratized democratizing tools, and it was this really exciting thing. And, and truthfully, I really liked Facebook for a very long time. I guess, and now my relationship has changed quite a bit. But um, but this was something that I I obsessed over, and a lot of people did. And when photos arrived to Facebook, this was a huge 
freaking deal on college campuses because suddenly you could upload photo albums with your friends yeah. from all of these parties around campus and or, or activities I guess and uh, <laughs> and share them with people and you could also like see who was going to uh, who was likely to show up at certain parties and who you might meet and that sort of thing and uh, it's amazing because there was so much excitement around uploading photo albums and giving each photo a caption and tagging your friends at a certain point. Um, and now I feel like people so infrequently publish albums on Facebook. It's, it's, it, it's, it's come, uh, into, you know, it's done a complete 180. So now I rarely see people posting photo albums, uh, and it's just really hard to justify at this point. I think more people, I, I see more people, at least of my age group, that are heading to the cloud and basically um, using using software like Google Photos or using iCloud and um, and using that as an archive for all of their photos and then sort of disseminating the photos one by one via text or via messaging platforms as they wish. So for example, I was out with a friend this weekend. We were hanging out with his two twin daughters and, uh, and we took a bunch of photos and, you know, we were at a diner and all of this stuff. And at the end of the day, we just shared a couple of photos via text in the past we would have posted those things on facebook and that would I have been our right. way of sharing them with each other i think so, personal sharing has really taken off yeah the the the, the social dynamic uh, has changed a lot for me personally i hadn't thought about that i've seen that in people around me how about you paris do you yeah i mean i think it's the same i i took a trip uh up the other weekend with some friends to a cabin and at the end of it we all created a shared uh, apple uh, photos, uh, an iPhotos album, and then added and commented there. I think it also, it's representative of this shift from public open platforms to kind of more semi-private uh, controlled spaces, because we're all realizing that a totally open public internet or social network experience is a modern hellscape, and we'd rather <laughs> be around the people that we choose to be around. Um I bet you Facebook's some people case. are using uh, Facebook Messenger, though, to do that somewhat more private sharing. Yeah, um, which yep. means Facebook still got access yeah. to all the info. Uh, yeah. But yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, there are things that default public, like Facebook, and things that default private, like Google Photos and Apple Photos. Well, and uh, and you know, with the, I'll add that if I would have posted some of those photos on Facebook, I think it would have been a little bit offensive. So there's this new, uh, I think, offensive there's a new to the people whose to, pictures they were. Like, Correct. why are you yes. sharing my our private stuff to the public? Yeah, and like, yeah. oh, I look like I look like garbage yeah. in that photo, yeah. or you know, they they would phrase it in a way that like they were uncomfortable with the way that they look. There's a button but really, in Facebook to do that. Mm -hmm. I was so shocked. My wife sent me that. She said, "Take that picture down. I find it offensive." Oh, really? Oh, that, that's yeah. hilarious. Yeah, there's I mean, a button I mean, on like, Facebook for that. Yeah, you can this untag it. You can make it so it doesn't show up yeah. on your profile. Yeah. I use that all the time. Oh, see, uh, there you go. Yeah. So I, and I find it so weird when. Sorry, continue. Well, no, no, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, it's a faux pas. It is a social faux pas. It's a faux pas to, to post photos of your friends without asking first, I think. Uh, and, and it's because the value of privacy is much greater than it was in 2001 or, you know, 2005 when I was in college. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so it's, that to me is really interesting. This shift in the value of privacy and how, and what moments we decide to share and what moments we, uh, decide to even share privately, uh, and just like the dissemination of this, of this, uh, you could call it data, I guess, but the dissemination of these photos, um, I think is, it, it represents the changing dynamic that people have, the changing relationship that people have with Facebook. Um, because Facebook used to be all about photos. That was the whole purpose of Facebook, really, when I was in college, it was about taking funny photos on your point and shoot. Well, that's what we have upload. Instagram for, though, right? Isn't Instagram yeah. the replacement? It, it is, stories. in many ways. I mean, you guys Instagram have, is Facebook. Paris, but, yeah. do you have a public Instagram or a, a private Instagram? So I ju I've always been the biggest advocate for public Instagrams because I thought private ones were dumb. But then over the past yeah. week, I uh, wrote a story about the incel community and some other people and started giving some harassing messages. So I had to take mine private yep. for the first time, which has actually been kind it's of fantastic. Not, I realized because now no. I, I looked through the people who I, were following me and I deleted all the ones I didn't know. Yep. And now when I post a story, it's, it's just to, to your friends, just to my friends. Yep. It's great. I love it. I'm not going back. My wife does that too. I think you're, I, it's, it's a changing culture a little bit. 
Uh, well, and I think there's a, a level of intellectualism and a level of like, uh, what is it? Classism, I guess that, you know, the people that are wealthiest and smartest are not are, are sharing the least, at least anecdotally in my life. You well, know, there was the a big New York that, Times article about how Silicon Valley <laughs> says don't use this crap. They don't want, your, they don't want their kids using <laughs> screens. Want, and Steve Jobs wouldn't let his kids use iPads. Uh, the founders of Facebook, no. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, they, they maybe were the canaries in the coal mine. They were the first to realize the dangers of all this. Yeah, and, and of course there are exceptions to the rule. Kim Kardashian shows us a lot of her life, I guess. I heard it was. I, th I heard the Kardashians. It was over. That that's over. Somebody oh, told the, me their 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 it's reign a, is the, their reign is over. Their reign of terror is over. Oh wow! Yeah. I I, so I might tell? be a little bit out. I don't know how you know, but I guess <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't. I don't know because I don't ever see him. I I should point out. I know people watch the shows regularly know this, but I I in August killed Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr uh, completely. Uh. Congrats. I, I deactivate wow. all the accounts. I have never been happier. I don't... Do you I, ever miss I, them? Yeah, well, so what's interesting is I used to know everything that was going on in... in you know, like I knew everything going on with you, you Harry. You'd you post these... You talk about my Instagram. Yeah, you and Marie would post these great <laughs> uh, antique uh, technology pictures and stuff like that. So I like that, and I miss it, but I also realize that it's kind of a false intimacy to think that you know about people because you're following their social feeds... And that really, the only real intimacy is when I'm here and you're talking, we're talking to each other, uh, or even on Skype. I mean, I think that's real. But I, but I think that there's this fo this phony th sense that you know you, you're keeping up with your friends because you see them on Facebook and Instagram. I don't miss. I really don't miss. And I really didn't like the FOMO stuff. The, yeah. <laughs> you know, you see these, and you've written some brilliant stuff, Paris, on the Facebook influencers and. You know, the whole culture, um, I'm sorry, Instagram, the whole culture on Instagram has become a little weird and creepy and show off -y, And I don't like it. Yeah, nothing is really real. And it's, but yet people kind of judge it as if what they're seeing is real. Um, I don't know. One, I think this is perhaps a story in the New York Times a couple of months ago where, it was this one penthouse apartment in Manhattan yes. that was rented out by influencers uh, by the hour or day or week where they could go and take beautiful photos in like a luxurious living room or apartment or bathroom and then add that as if it's their own home where they're taking uh, uh, photos in. And I thought that that kind of crystallized it in the fact that nothing about uh, Instagram or for any of these sort of platforms that we look at is real. And even, I mean, I wrote, I've written pretty extensively about influencers, but I think even when you're talking about your friends, there's this uh, artifice that's inherent in every action that you have online. You've seen the uh, Boyfriends of Instagram feed, haven't you? Oh, I have not. Oh, my God. It's, it's, it's just a bunch of pictures of people taking pictures, the behind the scenes. <gasps> oh. Oh, no, I know. I know the Instagram boyfriend meme. Yeah. Yeah. Oof. The behind the, I, the trouble people oof. go to get the angles, the shot. I, I got to I have to try and submit this because I so Wired's New York offices are in uh, the World Trade Center. And I swear every single day when I go to work, there are five, <laughs> maybe more people trying to get really cool shots uh -huh. near the World Trade Center or the Oculus building um, with their gaggle of friends around them trying to take photos. <laughs> <laughs> just to get the angle, man. You just wow. <laughs> my yeah. friend Chris Marquardt, who does a photo uh, thing on uh, the radio show, oh actually is starting a campaign, and he says that Jackson Hole, Wyoming, does this no hashtags, because one of the problems with Instagram is these beautiful places, or even just the front of the Wired building, are becoming uninhabitable because of all these people Instagramming their experience. Hashtags are the worst in general. So Jackson Hole, Wyoming has like the hashtag, no hashtags, please. Or don't say where you took this picture because it's just... Don't tag it, yeah. Don't tag it. And I have to say, I mean, going to a concert has been ruined for me because not so much... I mean, it was bad enough people raising, you know, taking pictures the whole time, worse with an iPad, blocking your view. But the last few concerts I've been to, there are people... The person, they're in the front row sometimes. There's a person singing his heart out. 
somebody turns around, turns their back <laughs> to the singer, and takes a selfie of themselves with the singer <laughs> behind them. I'll this give you one more on that. I was at a concert a couple of months ago, and the person in front of me had their phone up the entire time because they had FaceTimed in a bunch of Ugh. their friends to the concert and had Ugh. them piled up on FaceTime Ugh. the entire multi-hour concert. And we it was, know your life is fantastic. Yeah. You don't have to post it. Yeah. Do this concerts try to even try to police that stuff anymore? Because a, a couple of years ago, I went to one where somebody was doing that next to me and security came down and told him to cut it out. It really depends. Um, we saw a train and he actually... People, were, I was stunned, throwing their phones up on the stage so he could take a selfie and then throw it back at them. He, like, incorporated wow. it into the show. <laughs> it was, wow. That's it was incredible. Crazy. And it was kind of disruptive to his singing because he's, like, doing this the whole time. But I saw Springsteen on Broadway last week, closed on Saturday, close yesterday. We got in there at the last minute, and they're very clear. You may not take out your phone, but they understand the culture, so they say... At the end of the show, we will turn up the house lights. Bruce will be taking his bows. You may then take a picture. And they were, boy, if somebody, I saw, if it was a little disruptive, ushers with flashlights. If anybody took their phone out of their pocket, they were going, nah, nah, nah. so, and I don't know if that's Bruce doing that or the theater or what, but I kind of appreciated it. I don't that's know. So sensible uh, compromise. Yeah. Dave Chappelle played uh, Radio City Music Hall a couple of years ago, and uh, he had a contractor that that zip locked your cell phone. They basically locked your phone up until the end of the show to yes, I've heard anyone. that. There's a They've company been that been makes bags. Yeah, you, for you, that you, purpose. You yeah yeah, and then they unlock at the end of the show. So this yeah, bag, you keep your incredible. phone in your possession. You just can't get to it. Yes, it's like in a, uh, a Faraday bag. And in, a, in an emergency, I think you can go out to the lobby and get back <laughs> into it. Yeah, I'm gonna get uh, this costume next uh, Halloween. Uh, this is the influencer Halloween <laughs> costume set. Everybody should nice. have this sport bra, uh, yoga pants, uh, perfectly clean white sneakers, black baseball cap, sunglasses. This is it. I think the baseball. I see cap it doesn't come with the Instagram boyfriend. That's no, probably an added like six to nine dollars extra. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, here's the uh, here's the definition of the Instagram boyfriend. Age 24, occupation. Full-time boyfriend, interest, whatever Bay wants. Description, nice. castrated by love. He's now more of an employee than a boyfriend. <laughs> All right, I want to take a break. We have lots more to talk about. Uh, Harry McCracken is here. He is technology editor at Fast Company. Always a welcome guest. It's great to have you. And when you come, you bring your wife, Marie. We love Marie. I love you, Marie. <laughs> and then Marie brings at photo Michael O'Donnell, who is the king of the Silicon Valley photographers. Did you get a shot of me on my new Super 73 fake electric bike? No? Wow, you missed a bet. You haven't had the camera out today. No. You're, you're uh, just here for uh, just sitting in the audience. Yep. Unbelievable. Getting ready for next year, just apply to travel the world. Oh, you want to be an influencer? No, I'm going to take photography of a family traveling the world. Oh, that would be a cool job. That would be a very fun. You're going to be their Instagram boyfriend. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> He's applied to be an Instagram boyfriend. And the photos will be incredible. <laughs> that's, you know, that's something very rich people do. I know this because uh, Catherine uh, had a family in New York, very wealthy family. She'd go out periodically and photograph them. They hire really good professional photographers because it's so hard to do all those selfies. Just right. have somebody do it for you. Position the hand so it looks like they took it. Oh, do you? Do you make them do this every time you take a picture and just get the hand out of the frame? Zoom in. <laughs> uh, Swamp Rat says he went to see the monkeys in 1986. Good on you, Swamp Rat. There was a no pictures policy. He took a few with his Instamatic anyway. <laughs> Somebody from Louisiana <laughs> Tech Union born walked up to me, reminded me about the no pictures policy, and then winked and said, Don't worry, I didn't see anything. See, I don't, an Instamatic would be fine. Take all the pictures you want. It doesn't have a big, bright screen. And Our show today brought to you by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans, introducing something really cool. We've talked before about Rocket Mortgage because people like us, I don't, I'm kind of an introvert. I don't want to go to a bank and fill out an application and have to dress up and pretend I don't need a loan to get a home loan. I actually don't even want to put pants on. I just want to do it on my couch. 
And that's what Rocket Mortgage, believe it or not, Quicken Loans knows. That's what I love about Quicken Loans. They're kind of techie. They understand this. They are the number one mortgage lender in the country. According to customer satisfaction results, nine years in a row, J.D. Power says, number one, nine years in a row in customer satisfaction. That's for a mortgage origination, the approval process. Number one in customer satisfaction and mortgage servicing, five years in a row. So, so they, they, that they've been really dominant. They also number one lender in the country as of last year. So that's really great. Congratulations, Quicken Loans. And it's things like Rocket Mortgage, I think, that make the difference. Uh, 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 thinking about the customer experience. So Rocket Mortgage, it's entirely online. You go to rocketmortgage.com slash twit2. I know you're probably not getting a home loan right now. You're busy. Some people are. But you wouldn't hurt to go sign up for it, rocketmortgage.com slash twit2. That speeds up the process because let's say you're then in an open house. Maybe, you you know, or maybe you're driving around looking at Christmas lights and suddenly you say, I see a for sale sign. You go look at the house. You say, we need a loan. Now you're ready. The three-step power buying process begins and you won't believe how easy it is. First, you go to the website, rocketmortgage.com slash twit2. Answer a few simple questions. They will then come back and say, look, based on your credit, you are you can get a loan. These are the rates you can get. These are the terms you can get. These are the down payment, et cetera. You choose the perfect loan for you, and you now get pre-qualified approval. That was, in, in most cases, less than 10 minutes and involved no research on your part. You didn't have to look up your, you know, your dog's social security number or get pay stubs or anything. You just basic stuff, name, address, pay date of birth, social, that kind of thing. Then step two happens kind of automatically. Quicken Loans verifies your income, assets, and credit. And within 24 hours, in most cases, they're going to give you what they call verified approval. You now get a letter. You give your realtor. You give the seller that says, they're good for it. They got the loan. They're qualified. You have the strength of a cash buyer. And that makes a huge difference when you're buying a house. Once you're verified, you also qualify for something that I think is very timely. Rates are going up. You noticed, perhaps. That gives you a little anxiety, a little spilkis. You're searching around for a house. You go, oh, God, we got to buy a house quick. The rate's going to go up. It's going to cost us a lot more. And maybe you buy a house that's not perfect. I want you to buy the perfect house. So does Quicken Loans. That's why rate shield approval. They Once you get the verified approval, they lock your rate for up to 90 days. While you shop, you got three months even if rates go up, yours will not. If rates go down, yours will go down, so you win either way. But your rate cannot go up. This is exactly what you'd expect from America's largest mortgage lender and best, and the one that really thinks about you. Go to rocketmortgage.com slash twit2 and get started, and then when you find that house, you can, you can get the process underway. Rate shield approval is only valid on certain 30-year purchase transactions. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply based on Quicken Loans data in comparison to public data records, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states. NMLSConsumeraccess.org, number 3030. All you have to remember is this, rocketmortgage.com slash twit2. We thank them so much. They've been such a great supporter all year long, and we wish them the best in this holiday season. I didn't mention this, but Facebook <laughs> has some splaining to do. Actually, I should do, Facebook have got some splaining to do. The Irish Data Protection Commission, which oversees Facebook's compliance with the European regulations, probably GDPR, said yesterday or Friday that it had an, it launched a statutory inquiry into Facebook after receiving multiple reports of data breaches affecting the company. So the fine on this could be billions. Could be huge. 4% of their annual worldwide revenue. <laughs> Not profit, revenue. So there's that. I got that going for me. <laughs> I also have a portal. I have two of them. If anybody wants to buy them, I cannot get them returned. Facebook said you could have 30 days to return them. I said, I want, I sent them an email to support saying, I want to return them. They said, why? I said, I don't want them. <laughs> and that's the last I heard. <laughs> They said, nice. send, you us your, send us your invoice, your order number. I did all that. Nothing. And the 30 days oh. runs out in four days. What do I do? I'm going to keep them. Uh, do you have them plugged in? Do you use them? No, of course not. <laughs> what am I, crazy? Good. Put a high-def camera in my house with Facebook on the other end? Uh, Zuck wants to know what's going on. Wait a minute. I can play words with friends? 
Okay. There's no other device you can do that on. So. Uh -uh. <laughs> yeah. I found myself, I can't believe this, recommending it on the radio show to a caller yesterday. But he had the oh, really? perfect, well, he said my 85-year-old mother has a hard time with Skype and FaceTime. It's too complicated. But she's got relatives in China, us. All, what, what should we do? I said, get a Facebook portal. Because all your faces are on this. First of all, it's a, it's a really nice picture frame with your Facebook photo albums that you don't un upload anymore. And it has all the people that you can call. You could choose like five people or whatever that, that you call. And she just pushes the button and you appear. Plus, you can play words with friends with her. Facebook's, I guess, portal is such a success. It came, I didn't know this. Should have. It came out of their, uh, their Building 8, which is their uh, advanced technology stuff, right? ATAP. Um, and they've now renamed it. I guess it was such a success that the Building 8 is now called Portal. And they moved the more experimental stuff into a different lab. Um, so Portal's more, a big deal for them. Then. More tied to the AR and VR parts of the company. Yeah. We renamed the Building 18 Portal after that device launch. So maybe, I don't know, you guys have, uh, you, you want, I can send you one. <laughs> I got two. I stupidly bought two because I thought, well, I need one on each end. You don't. You can just use Facebook Messenger. I don't know. Maybe I'll keep using it. It has a They're little. They're actually fun. I mean, I, they I will are say. Fun. I admit. We've, we've. Yeah, we've done like remote. Uh, so we, I have to teleconference for work. We have some writers on the West Coast, and uh, we've used like a Microsoft, uh, one of the large Microsoft Surface, uh, like yeah. uh, whiteboard style um, Ooh, devices. Nice. Yeah, and and uh, we've tried all sorts of things. Google Meet. Uh, by far and away, the most popular uh, teleconferencing tool was the Facebook Portal because they had the best filters, so like people could. I, it was just more fun. It was a very, very fun conversation. The camera actually tracks people in the room, so like based on who's speaking, it'll it'll find the the face uh, that, that that the audio is coming from. And and uh, and yeah, it was actually really fun. I think my advice to people that are considering getting this device would be to just quarantine it, put it in a space that there isn't, you go, you know, in an office. I mean, I, I know that not everyone has an, a, a dedicated office room, but uh, but if you can find a room that isn't too revealing that isn't very high traffic i think it's a really cool tool to have in your arsenal you know in terms of uh just like reaching people across the country or across the world um but just i put I a, wouldn't, a hood on it like a falcon. yeah or just yeah unplug it whenever you're not using it. it then put it back in yeah minor unplugged yeah yeah great but, product but, but, terrible timing yeah yeah it's 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 in it it's kind of sad because it is actually technologically it's a great product i mean it's cool yeah and, uh, they, and they did delay it a little while. It, it sounds like out of concern. Because it's over right the after it was Cambridge. In the world. Yeah. 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 You have you used, so Michael, you've used the Surface Hub, the new Surface Hub? That yeah, we have. Yes, yeah, massive. Yeah, so uh, we I share think this looks with, really nice. It's, uh, it's cool. I mean, it's, it's, pro it's probably a little more powerful than we need for right. our purposes. Uh, we basically just use it to teleconference. Oh, so, yeah, if you're um, just talking. But, it's more for yeah, like for collaborating well. and and stuff like that. Yeah, and yeah. so yeah, generally speaking, we don't we don't present in those in those types of ways, I guess. Um, but it, it's I think it could work for some offices. Yeah, definitely. Like um, as a as a as a presenting tool, I think it it looks it it, it theoretically it would be really great. They're putting a um, lot of money into this. It's not available. I think the new one's coming out. When Harry next year, early next they year, they pre-announced it by a lot. Yeah, uh, several months ago. They showed it though. Uh, uh, Paul Thorat and Mary Jo Foley, I think, played with it. It was at Ignite at one of the Microsoft conferences, and they were very impressed. It did the rotating thing that it does. And I'm glad they're sticking with this idea. Um, I think there's business here. Cisco made must have made millions on those expensive rooms that they sold. You know, the conference rooms to people. This looks really interesting. I mean, it's basically a, a PC with a giant super screen. I know. Yeah. So I guess my criticism of this would be that you probably don't need touchscreen on such a large yeah. monitor. And uh, at least in the case of like our office, Google Meet works really well. It used to be Google Hangouts. Um, so I don't know. I think that you, most offices, if, from my perspective, would be better off with a very large HD TV connected to Google Meet, uh, and there's like there's little um, yeah. hubs that you can put behind the television set. But but you don't need the touchscreen. Uh, most people don't need those touchscreen um, 
capabilities, and right. they don't need that pen either. Uh, I think that's wow. just kind of extraneous for Facebook's the most got me. I'm gonna. Business. My mom loves to play words with friends. I think I'm gonna send one to her, and we could play Portal. Play the. That is pretty awesome. She loves words with friends, and then it'll zoom in on your victory dance, according to uh, CNET. I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I. They keep pulling me in. This is the problem. I deactivated my Facebook account. I had to reactivate it to buy the portal. Maybe was, that's why I haven't got the email. I was too polite to ask you why you had a portal if you were no longer on to Facebook. To review it, because I, for, I do it for you, the audience. I buy a lot of stupid stuff, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> like but, an e-bike. No, just joking. Oh, I actually my e-bike bike is awesome. I, I, Did you see the... <laughs> wait a minute. I so I, I actually have a bone <laughs> to pick with you. It sounds like you have a throttle on your e-bike, which... Gives people like me who use a pedal assist e-bike a uh, a bad name, but uh, I'm probably getting way in the weeds here. But um, e-bikes e oh, should not have is. a throttle on them. This is awesome. That's pretty pretty cool. This yeah. is the Super Seventy Three. It looks basically. I think I don't think they really mean it to be an e-bike. I think their goal with this bike is to look like an old motorcycle because the battery is where the tank would be. It, it looks like an old motorcycle. Yeah, yeah, it, it does. It looks very looks like cool. a Norton. Uh, do, do you have to pedal though? To, no. To... <laughs> so you so can, is... but you don't have so to. So it's basically like a motorcycle. It's a lie or to like fool a, like a the little, uh... police. Yeah, it's yeah. Got that, I, have, I have an issue with that, Leo. Because so what I use is something called a pedal assist e-bike. It yes. also has a large battery. Yes. And this you have to that. move the pedals. To you can turn. You. It has three levels of pedal assist or none. <laughs> nice nice i have actually i have uh also some uh rad power uh pedal assist normal they're really more normal but this yeah, is just yeah. i got this because of i mean that's pretty look how it looks awesome i gotta say yeah. i got it because casey neistat had it and i have to have it too nice to yeah those out. are illegal how those types works. of bikes yeah. are illegal in new york city you're not supposed oh, really? to have a yeah it's it's you're supposed to it, it's strictly pedal assist if you but have Arfacer, a throttle Arfacer. or a button Officer, it's got pedals and it's pedal assist, and it only goes twenty miles an hour, officer. I but was if just you're for the last hour, officer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I didn't see your feet move, Laporte. No, because I'm very strong. One pedal is all it takes. I just <laughs> yeah. it was a yeah. big pedal. <laughs> yeah, it's it's an issue right now in the bike lanes in, yes, in New York because not. they're basically electric the motorcycles. Three bike lanes in New York City. Yeah. <laughs> not such a big issue in pedal yeah. my No, here they let me ride all over the place. Um, That's awesome. I, mean, I will say it looks really, really isn't cool. Isn't cool? It looks awesome. What's, uh, what's that's on the an example there? of a... That's the headlamp. Head yeah, look at that. Yeah, that's cool. And See, they're it, trying to look like a motorcycle. Is it priced like a motorcycle or like an electric okay. bike? Does it what? Crash? Like is a it, motorcycle? No, is it priced <laughs> like, a, like a motorcycle? It's, it's 2300 bucks. Okay. All right. So that's uh, great. Bikes that that electric range. bikes tend to be very expensive, right? What do you, what yeah. do you, what do you ride, uh, Michael? It's, uh, it's from a company called Priority. And uh, the bicycle is called the Embark. Uh, and I love so e-bikes. I am like an e-bike fanatic. If I lived it, I mean, if I had a commute, I would do it on an e-bike. Yeah, same. That's 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 uh, really the goal. So for me, it's about an hour long bike Ooh, ride, and I actually love doing it. Yeah, because I show up really you. sweaty and gross. Yeah. You know. So yeah, and this is this is the one. Beautiful. That I and the thing is, uh, you're still pedaling. You still get plenty of exercise. But when yeah, there's a hill, the you don't surprise. have to kill yourself. That's exactly right. Yeah. So for the bridge, you know, I cross from Brooklyn into Manhattan and, oh, uh, and I can just cruise over the bridge. It is oh. so, so nice. So this has been, I mean, biking in general has been a huge game changer for me. It's just added a, a, a lot of happiness to my life basically. Um, but this new e-bike thing is like, this is the new frontier. So I just got it in the fall. I haven't had a chance to ride it too much in the winter, but um, I'm really expecting to get around most places in the in the spring and summer using using that bike. I think so, it's a revolution. I think it's, it's good for the awesome. climate. I think it's good for the environment. I hope that more people go. Mo I have uh, big solar panels on the roof, so I'm generating my own electricity. I love it. I think it's great. Meanwhile, <laughs> people are vandalizing Waymo self-driving vehicles. <laughs> uh, they're all over Arizona, I guess. <laughs> and uh, what is underreported, but uh, Arizona Central has a story, uh, police have responded to dozens of calls regarding people threatening and harassing the Waymo self-driving vans. Uh, they, they, they start the story, a Waymo self-driving van cruised through a Chandler neighborhood August 1st when a test driver, Michael Palos, saw something startling as he sat behind the wheel. A bearded man in shorts 
aiming a handgun at him as he passed the driveway. 21 wow. interactions documented by Chandler police over the last two years where people have harassed the autonomous vehicles and their human test driver's tires slashed when stopped at traffic. Rocks thrown. One Jeep was responsible for forcing the vans off the road six times. Why are people so angry about self-driving vehicles? Uh, uh, I, I think that story says that the guy with the gun was, was suffering from dementia. Oh, okay. At least according to his wife. But yes. I do worry this like foreshadows what the world will be like a few years from now if self-driving vehicles are everywhere. <laughs> Well, I mean, it reminds me of the same sort of backlash faced by the Nightscape security bots. Hey, but that wasn't um, what I was going to bring up. Were, people kick them. Yeah, someone, and, and someone are throwing scooters uh, into the river over and them oh, or geez, turned Louise. them over. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just. This may be the theme to this show, but there is a backlash against technology, isn't there? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, without a doubt, I think you could characterize this year, uh, 2018, as a. Uh, is like a, you know, there's been a, a kind of a tide change or a, a tectonic shift in the way that people interact <laughs> with technology. Sorry? You got to wonder why a guy with dementia had a handgun, but that's that's Arizona for you. Marriott, yeah. New York Times, Marriott data breach. Remember that one? Mm. Oh, yeah, it was oh, yeah. only two weeks ago. Uh, <laughs> half a billion records for people who use the Starwood uh, Group uh, reservation system, including in some cases passports. People like me. Man, me? Who didn't? I'm, I'm like Starwood Gold. Yeah, yeah. me too. Yeah. Half a billion people. That's got a lot of people. Turns out, according to the New York Times, which is quoting, of course, our intelligence agencies, that the hack came from China. Uh, and the, actually, the larger story, it was part of a large four-year intelligence gathering effort. You remember when the Office of Personnel Management, the U.S. government's OPM, was hacked? That was part of it. Um, apparently, the Chinese, even though they deny this, by the way, I should, I should give them fair, fair reporting here. China firmly opposes all forms of cyber attack and cracks down on it in accordance with the law. If offered evidence, the relevant Chinese departments will carry out investigations according to the law. Apparently, according to the anonymous sources in this article, uh, the Chinese started doing this in 2014 because they wanted to gather information about uh, spies. Um, it wasn't about you and me, uh, but they wanted to know about uh, Chinese nationals in the United States, where they traveled. They wanted to know uh, about uh, other people. They were kind of keep American. Remember the Anthem hack, the American health insurance uh, company, Anthem, also. Part of that, they wanted social security numbers and patients' medical histories. Um, and just it's another story that I guess I credit. I don't know. And the the um, data that was taken has not shown up on the dark web, right? Which people say suggests that's it's, the giveaway. It's a state actor, right? It doesn't, it doesn't indicate mm -hmm. it's China particularly, right? But it might mean it's not some random individual. And, and what are people I mean, supposed? To oh, go ahead. Oh, I mean, the data in this case, like, while it is not, uh, I guess, like social security numbers or something that in and of itself you think of as a large security risk, any number of identifying uh, information can be used to identify you in other means or uh, find out more about a particular person or their habits online if you're also combining that with other information from data brokers or perhaps, like, anonymized information, the sort of information that... Uh, an entity could collect from a hack of, yeah, Marriott. Um, why, while it could seem innocuous in uh, certain lights, when combined with other uh, pools of information or data, it can uh, reveal people's identities. There was a truce. We thought we uh, we had a truce with uh, China over cyber warfare and cyber espionage back in 2015. Um. They apparently uh, agreed not to do it, and we agreed not to do it to them. On the other hand, General Clapper, James Clapper, the former uh, head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, said, hey, well, if we could do it, we'd do it to them. <laughs> so maybe it's just uh, tit for tat, as they say. Uh, Chinese were also interested in getting information about American security officials. You know, anything you can get is going to be useful. So there is that. I'll throw I'll throw that into the mix. 
Um, well, he, here's the question I wanted to ask, which is what are people supposed to do in these cases? You know, this isn't the first gigantic uh, hack that, that's been committed. There was, uh, you know, Target at one point. Equifax. I think Home Depot is in there. Equifax. Yahoo, yeah, Tumblr, Yahoo. everything. Yeah. So, Michael, they're supposed to do what you do, which is throw up your hands and say, I give up on privacy. <laughs> right? I mean, isn't that I, what you I did? Think it, it is to a certain extent. Yeah, I think like, you know, there are definitely best practices, right? You're supposed to, um, I don't know, it helps to change your password every, every so often or have varying levels of, uh, of, of, uh, of, um, sorry, of, well, of supposedly, password security. Well, supposedly, those companies are also supposed to do things like that. Marriott did none of them. They had the worst security practices ever. And so that's the other thing I think we need to do, which is hold these companies' feet to the fire. That's what GDPR does. But I think we should have something in the United States, too, that if a company breaches its responsibility to protect our data in a, in a uh, really gross way, like Marriott did, that they should pay a severe fine. That should be a penalty. Equifax not only got off scot-free, they made money on it. Yeah, yeah, very well said. I mean, I, would, I completely agree with that. The sad thing is that there is no piece of legislation that I've seen that nobody's doing it. Is is yeah? I mean, it's just we're years away from this. It's it's pathetic. Well, uh, congratulations! I have to offer uh, congratulations to YouTube Rewind. It is now the most hated video on uh, YouTube. Finally, beat Justin Bieber's baby. <laughs> The Rewind, uh, every <laughs> every year, the Rewind, well, you you cover this stuff in Mashable. What, uh, tell us, the Rewind celebrates YouTube creators, right? And this year, it started as it often does with a celebrity, in this case, Will Smith, who used YouTube to stream jumping off a cliff with a bungee cord or a, no, I guess he jumped out of a helicopter with a, yep. here, let me. Knight and Marquez Brownlee. And Marquez getting a shout out. They're all in a bus. Is this what you wanted? There's you know Marquez. I asked for? Quit horsing around. Oh, oh, that's uh, what what's his name? Ninja. Ninja. You said jumping music? Jumping music. <laughs> Cause you know why? Cause they're in a Fortnite bus, and they're gonna have to jump out. So even though Google has YouTube has nothing to do with Fortnite, they're gonna jump on the Fortnite bandwagon. Thank you. Bye, Ninja. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, what this really is, is this makes the, the creators, the YouTube stars, happy, right? They get this day in the sunshine. Marquez Brownlee's got to be just jumping up and down. Uh, but well, for... well, yeah, I, I don't think actually most, I think most of the creators were unhappy with the way that this were came out. Were they embarrassed? I think many of them were. And then the other issue is that a lot of the most popular creators were not featured. So people like Logan Paul and uh, PewDiePie. PewDiePie. Logan Paul would have been, yeah, both of those I feel like would have been a little controversial had they been yeah. included. Both of them were sanctioned by YouTube for stuff they did this year. Right, so. Alex Jones. <laughs> Alex no, Jones. But, yeah. but, <laughs> but look at this. This is why the uh, creators were unhappy. Because before, when they did it, they were happy. Then they saw 13 million thumbs down on a video that has 139 million views. Let's see. I think Marquez had a uh, response here. Let's see what uh, the problem with YouTube Rewind is. This is this Marquez's uh, video. Yeah, I think he yeah, talked like a little Marquez. bit about behind the scenes. Oh, he's amazing. YouTube Rewind. Every year, the biggest celebration of of the top stuff on YouTube that year, the biggest creators, the best videos, the memes, everything. At least we thought. A lot of people have been asking me about this. You may have noticed about a week ago, YouTube Rewind 2018 was uploaded, and uh, it's not exactly doing too hot. In fact, it's currently, in just a few days, the second most disliked video ever uploaded now number one. of all time. First place being <laughs> Justin Bieber's Baby, and it's on pace to pass that probably pretty soon. So the most outwardly hated video ever uploaded to the site. Can I just ask, really ask and a quick question? Is he wearing advertising on his jacket? Oh God! Uh, he'd be uh, probably. Smart I don't too. know what next gen. He'd better is, be. Yeah, he's <laughs> he's definitely getting paid oh, for that if it's not. Yeah, some I would be if I were him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay. he's like a NASCAR quick, driver. He's like a NASCAR driver yeah. or a chess yeah. grandmaster. NASCAR, yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah, no, Karsten, like... why don't I have anything to wear? I'm. I need some. Badges. That's why the eBay. 
bike is there, right? <laughs> the, yeah. the e bike. I wish they were paying me. I was paying yeah, them. Ask your son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's my son. My son's doing sales for us right now. So Mark has, I guess, said a lot of people were. I have to think that the number of dislikes had something to do with <laughs> their repudiation of the YouTube Rewind. It's worth watching. It's got 139 million views. It's an honor. Uh, it's an honor. To be fair, it's it, it is a terrible video. It is one of oh, the worst awful. things I've <laughs> I've seen on YouTube all year. Well, wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute. No, it's not. It's not even close. Let's be yeah, honest. I guess that's there true. There are some I've bad seen some things pretty... on YouTube. There is yeah. n there that is even yeah, close yeah. to the worst videos on YouTube. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. Fair point. Fair point. <laughs> Um, but, but it, it was, I think it was just, it wasn't representative of what the network is. You know, I think to, I, I think to say that it's a celebration of the creators and of some of the most popular things on YouTube while turning a blind eye, turning a very obvious blind eye to all of the smarmy, smutty, terrible stuff. Um, I, I think, I think that was the reason why people were outraged. It just simply did not represent what was happening on the network. They wanted Alex yeah. Jones jumping out of a bus. That, yeah. that. They wanted yeah, 7 exactly. million videos of Jordan <laughs> Peterson defeating some feminist. Oh. Um, Goodness. Well, and oh. also it was a little too long. I think that it just went on and on and on and on. And so it was trying to be everything to everyone and actually it just failed to to do any anything well. Um, even the MKBHD um, uh, uh, cameo, you know, he explains in his video that he shot, you know, over 15 minutes of uh, of this Fortnite scene and they ended up using a very small portion that of- That was Elon of, Musk's defense too, wasn't it? I just want yeah. to announce that the rest of this show is brought to you by the Welsh National Government <laughs> and the Leak <laughs> Council. <laughs> nice, nice. What do you think? Good. Yeah. I, I hope, love it. I hope you're getting paid well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's that much money in leaks. <laughs> I but love leaks for what it's worth. Yeah. Oh, leaks good. Are, yeah. Oh, see? They're great. Kale We're leak leaks. We love yeah. leaks. Yeah. We, leaks are great. big leak cabal here, yeah. It's, yeah, leaks. <laughs> Eat more leaks. Yay, leaks. Yay, leaks. Leaks. Uh... <laughs> Microsoft Teams is growing ridiculously fast. This actually is a little bit of a surprise. So uh, Slack bought HipChat, the Atlassian They, they bought product. like some of the IP of HipChat. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, that's right. Atlassian still owns. Which was sort of dwindling. I mean, HipChat is, they're winding it down. And Slack is number one, right? Microsoft would like to get into that business. So they decided to give away. You're not going to take me seriously while I'm wearing this, are you? They decided to, I'm taking you, off you the leak. You just look so authoritative. <laughs> I'm taking off the leak. I don't care, Welsh leak It kind of looks like a crown to me, but yeah. anyways. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, it actually is, a, it's an actually, it's a helmet that I'm going to wear riding my e-bike down the street and see if anybody points a gun <laughs> at me. For visibility. Yeah. 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 Uh, for visibility. Um, you know, the beard sheds, unfortunately. So uh, we we had to decide. We were using HipChat. We had to decide, and uh, HipChat was a sponsor, and so we switched to Slack, which became a sponsor. So that's a good thing. Um, but but Slack is not free. Slack has a free tier, but really uh, it's a pretty good free tier. It's a decent. We, that's we use a free tier. We don't use a paid version. But uh, Microsoft Teams is really free and apparently growing like crazy. Teams. I think also is tiered, and you have to pay for the really good stuff. Oh, okay. But they did. Uh, they gave it a lot more away. They for came free. out with an aggressively good free tier yeah. after not having had super amounts of traction. But I bet you if you ask all the cool kids, they're using Slack. Cool kids? Yes. Yeah, I've yes, only ever used Slack. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, Microsoft it's just the most Slack. robust right now. And I think uh, I think some of these tools will be... Um, will be democratized or I think that 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 you know Slack doesn't really do anything that unique it's just instant messaging with emojis basically and and also their embeds are are really nice like the inline chat embed so if I see a YouTube clip and I drop that in the chat it will embed that video so that someone doesn't have to click out to YouTube. We can just watch the video nice. within the chat. It's fantastic for a newsroom that is like really, especially a, a digital, uh, digitally native newsroom. That is super important for tweets, for YouTube, for basically any of this uh, content that we're that we're uh, digesting throughout the day. Um, but I also just don't think that that's that unique. At the end of the day, Facebook and Microsoft and all of these companies that employ hundreds of engineers can just as easily create an instant instant messaging platform with embeds, and uh, my expectation is that it's 
that's going to become a very competitive uh, marketplace because you know fr- from what I read, Slack was talking about potentially going public next year, and if if that's the case, I think uh, it's similar to Uber in that you know what they're the, the the technology aspect isn't all that unique. What's what's really good about their business right now is that they they've scaled really well. They have a lot of people that have bought into that system, uh, but it will be easy for competitors to create copycat versions of those businesses. And, uh, and so I, I, I think that there's inherently a lot of risk with something like Slack or like, uh, or Uber, I guess, from a, from a business standpoint, I don't think that they do anything that unique, you know, it's, it's not impossible for Facebook or Microsoft to create something similar in my opinion. Slack did a good job of giving it a lot of polish, which is harder than it looks. I mean, hip, hip it ch- is elegant. Hip yeah, chat nice. was an arch rival for a while, it's ugly. But, but Slack was a lot more polished and pleasant yeah, to use. Fun. And I am glad to see that um, Microsoft is doing okay, just because I think it's healthy for uh, Slack to have at least one major arch rival. Um, Facebook has Facebook at work, which they're, they're certainly still. Does anybody use that? They certainly do have some big users. Facebook employees but, do. Ma- Mashable. Well, Mashable uses. Really? Uh, we do, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. But uh, I'm, I'm not a, a huge fan of it, right but. now. Yeah. I'd like to announce that right after 60 Minutes this evening on CBS, it's the all-new Freaks and Leaks, a show... No. (laughs) Hill Leaks Blues. No. Uh, We're going to take a little break. Live Leaks. Live Leaks. (laughs) TMZ presents Live Leaks. Uh, We had a... Do we have a... a, No no promo promo this week. Oh, God, you were going to get me out of this. (laughs) <laughs> that's all folks <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey actually I want to say a good thing about face recognition I had no oh, idea wow. do you know that Taylor Swift has oh, yeah. lots of stalkers I don't even want to say a number but I'm actually I guess I'm not surprised hundreds Hundreds. so they've used they start security for Taylor Swift at California's Rose Bowl last May used face recognition to f- to sp- Spot the stalkers. Hundreds of images of known Taylor Swift stalkers. The kiosk was set up to show highlights of the singer's rehearsals. Secretly recorded the faces of onlookers, which were sent to a command post across the country in Nashville. Everybody who went by would stop and stare at the software would start working, according to Chief Security Officer at Live Entertainment Security Company, Oakview Group, who personally attended the event it's unknown if any of the footage were kept or even if it identified any real stalkers or what happened if it did. But, you know, this is actually confirming something we've been hearing for some time, which is that stadiums routinely use face recognition to recognize rowdy fans, fans that have been kicked out in the past. A man, if I were Taylor Swift, you bet I'd use that. Yeah, I think this is actually a pretty common practice at this point. I remember earlier this year, um, China in, in China, uh, the Chinese police use facial facial recognition to identify uh, jaywalkers. A, a no, no, no. Oh, it was at okay. a concert. It was like it was oh. a sea of of you know sixty thousand people, and they were able to find this man that was accused of economic crimes or something like that. So uh, I just wow. remember the headline being you know what this this that this person was found in a sea of sixty thousand people at a concert and. Uh, and also, I believe Ticketmaster announced that they were going to be embracing um, more facial recognition or surveillance uh, technology at concerts in the U.S. So I think basically my my view on this is if you're going to a concert, uh, you're probably being surveilled to an extreme degree <laughs> at this point. I think it's actually I, I, it's it's becoming fairly common. And, and uh, wow. And I guess I'm OK with that. Yeah, I mean. I'm interested to see how this works from an advertising perspective, though, because when it comes to concerts, I've always been a bit wary or kind of interested in the uh, overlap of security technology and advertising ever since um, I went to a concert earlier this year, I think the Arctic Monkeys, and the only way that I could use my ticket that I purchased was to download an app by the company Axis. And of course, and I also had forgotten to, I don't know, bring headphones in the subway over. So I decided to read the privacy policy for the app on my way over. And I realized that essentially it was taking a log of like everything the (gasps) phone was doing, everywhere you went, um, where you moved within once you were using your ticket. And I assume that if these stadiums are 
deploying facial recognition technology. Then, and oh, um, so they were taking that uh, information and selling it to advertisers. So I assume that oh facial recognition t- technology will go there too. They'll know that, oh, you looked at um, Coca Cola possibly getting like a freezy for three right. minutes right. and then decided yeah. not to. Oh my yep. God. So, you know what? Yeah. This is going to be the new normal. And the, so the only real mm-hmm. advice is, is, you know, download the app, use it to get in and then delete it immediately. Yeah. Don't give it any per- permissions. Have yeah. your phone in airplane mode. Um, Jeez Louise. That's terrible. It's crazy. That's terrible. It was a, um, you had to show a barcode, barcode that was constantly refreshing, kind of like an authenticator app. So there was no way to get around it. It was ostensibly supposed to stop ticket scalping. Yeah. That's the excuse. Sell isn't it. it. Yeah. But. Of you know, course, the number of things it was pulling from you at the same time was I should insane. look at, uh, to get into Springsteen, we had to use, oh no, it was the Harry Potter show. We had to use the Ticketmaster app, which didn't work, by, by the way. I ended up getting tickets printed anyway. Um, I bet you I bet you <laughs> anything, funny. I should look at the permissions on that Ticketmaster app. I bet you anything, it's doing exactly the same thing. Yeah, anytime you have to download an app, it probably is. That's so um, annoying. Th- that's the New York Times just came out with that piece yes. earlier this week um, about all the different apps that are tracking your location and selling it at any given point. And I've been saying this for some time though, that cause I've seen a lot of apps like uh product hunt released an app. that was kind of a goofy app called sip. You remember this? It's still out. It would give you one headline a day. Cause you would just, it, you, you can't drink the news river. So sip from the news straw one little, but I don't think that was the point of that app. <laughs> I increasingly think people will do anything to get an app on your phone because the data they get is so valuable that they're just going to do anything make up apps it's very sad let's take we got I, i'm we've been keeping you guys so long and i appreciate it we do have one big story i want to do this bef- and then uh we'll end with that big story setback in the outback as signal calls it but first a word from the fresh air filling this studio right now smells good doesn't it marie smells good in here yeah yeah you know i cooked bacon in here just an hour before the show and you can't tell can you because we've got a molecule molecule is the world's first molecular air purifier that reduces symptoms for allergy and asthma sufferers we we got a molecule first at home because lisa used to wake up with headaches because we live in the country and there's pollen and dust and stuff and all of a sudden, after we moved, she started getting headaches. So we got the molecule. Headaches went away. And I know it was a molecule because when we stay overnight somewhere, the headaches come back. She, she, this is an amazing technology. It replaces 50 years of antiquated air purification technology. That HEPA, HEPA filter that's in most of these things, it, that's been used to clean your air since 1940. There haven't really been major innovations since. It's just trapping stuff. Molecule des- destroys it. It's called Pico technology, photoelectrochemical oxidation. It was it was created and funded by the EPA, tested by real people, verified by third parties and university labs like the University of South Florida's Center for Biological Defense, the University of Minnesota's Particle Calibration Lab. It goes so much farther than a HEPA filter. First of all, it doesn't just trap allergens eliminates them it destroys them not just allergens mold bacteria even tiny viruses and airborne chemicals vocs formaldehyde from the carpet paint fumes all of that captured trapped destroyed pollutants a thousand times smaller than those a hepa filter can catch we liked it so much we got one for our son and we have two of them and i, t- I tell you when we had the fires up here and all that smoke that molecule saved our lives we got one in the studio too I have them everywhere. I love the molecule. It's beautiful. It's clean, sleek design. They set, they kind of say the apple of air purifiers. It's got a solid aluminum shell. You can also get a filter subscription service, so you just get filters automatically. You can. I, I, we have it connected to our Wi-Fi network, so I can control it from my phone. Uh, and it will automatically order new filters that way, which is awesome when it needs them. But you don't have to do that. It's got a button on top that completely controls it. It is really awesome. Just gets everything out of the air it smells great and even if it's a giant room like our studio the molecule works great 75 dollars off your first order they have a silent mode and then when and then if you do make bacon you turn on the boost mode and she cleans the air out so fast 75 dollars off your first order but don't delay because these are selling out fast 
Molecule is M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E dot com and use the promo code TWIT75 to get 75 bucks off. Molecule, M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E dot com. Offer code TWIT75. Australia this week passed, it was a last minute bill passed by the Australian Parliament before they recessed the Assistance and Access Bill, which has given people fits. This is from Signal. But I've seen blog posts from 1Password now and many other companies. Because the bill requires that a company that has encryption can offer the encrypted data in clear text upon the request of law enforcement in Australia. A backdoor. Signal says, well, we can't do that because we can't read your message. We don't have any access to your message. But the Australian law would require them, would require them to put a back door and signal so that they could give them this and there's severe penalties if they don't, this data. Ironically, <laughs> according to Signal, the Prime Minister of Australia, Malcolm Turnbull, uses Signal. Members of government everywhere use Signal because it's private. Um, one of the ways, according to uh, Signal, that the assistance and access bill is particularly terrible lies in, a, in its potential to isolate Australians from the services they depend on and use every day. Like Signal, maybe like your password vault. Over year, uh, time, users may find a growing number of apps no longer behave as expected. New apps might never launch in Australia at all. It doesn't seem like smart politics. So it isn't yet in effect, and I'm, I think there's perhaps some hope that the courts in Australia will overturn it, or maybe the parliament will get its mind back. I use a, a, a Australian mail provider, Fast Mail, which I love. But as soon as I read this, I looked at means to change my mail away from Fast Mail. What do you think, Harry? I mean, the argument is that backdoors are always incredibly dangerous because nobody is smart enough to build a backdoor, but they can be positive, uh, won't get intruded on by a bad guy. And that seems like a pretty That's the problem. compelling argument. I'm not against catching terrorists, but I I don't want this bill to make us all less safe, and that's what we think it would do. I don't have a fundamental objection to certain scenarios in which governments can look at this stuff, uh, but it's really dangerous from a security standpoint, according to almost every security expert I've ever seen chime in on this. Yeah. And I'll I'll be... Look, I want to help law enforcement, but they already have amazing surveillance capabilities. This last little bit of dark pixel matter and their giant HD opt panopticon is not critical to them doing their job, I don't think. Uh, and it makes us all less safe. Proton Mail, uh, same thing. What's wrong with the assistance and access uh, law? The Australian government is really a leader in encryption backdoors. <laughs> So this is basically breaks encryption permanently. It goes farther than even Russia, which block, but bans encryption. Turkey bans encryption. China bans encryption. This says, oh, you're going to have encryption as long as we can see what you're doing. So it's not encryption. <laughs> it's worse than banning it. At least when you ban it, you don't know, you know, you don't. This f And the problem is it doesn't just impact us. It impacts if Apple says, oh, well, well we want to sell phones in Australia. We guess we got to put a back door on the iPhone. That inf impacts every single iPhone user in the world. And Apple and Google and Microsoft have all come out against this. Yeah. I just wanted to raise the issue, uh, you know, if you're, and we have many Australian listeners, I'm sure you're just as upset about this as we are. Contact your member of parliament. Yeah, I mean, I think it seems to be just another example of the people who are making the laws do not understand the effects that these sort of rulings are going to have at the community at large while it may seem like on one level a way to help law enforcement um I, i'm not sure of the makeup of australia's parliament or if they're experiencing similar issues but i know that in the u.s this is the common refrain whenever there's another social media filtering hearing is that the people who are asking the questions or have the power to uh make these decisions from a governmental standpoint do not understand the technology that right. they wield this power over. Please don't do it. It makes us all less safe. That's all. Just don't do it. It's bad for Australia. It's bad for the world. Uh, the FCC, speaking of bad for America, uh, 
has decided to change the rules governing text messaging, making uh, text messaging services not a telecommunications service, but a publishing service, which gives telecoms the right to censor text messages. In 2007, Verizon blocked texts from uh, NARAL, an abortion rights group. That sounds pretty political. Uh, we've seen other situations where uh, this, this has happened. The telcos are not notorious for their civil rights <laughs> focus. <laughs> Uh, giving them this power to block text messages they disagree with is very dangerous. Again, another one to write your member of Congress. I mean, theoretically, it gives them the ability to deal with spam, spam. texts. That's the pretext. Which doesn't sound like a bad thing, but the EFF says that um, it's not really going to help on that front. Uh, this is the same thing they did for net neutrality. They reclassified ISPs as information services rather than telecommunications company common carriers. Uh, just to, you know, a little update on the FCC. We like to do that every week. <laughs> they're, they're feeding us a lot of news. i got to let you guys go. You've been very patient. It's been a long show, but it's been so much fun. I didn't want to stop. Harry McCracken, to, uh, love your stuff. Technologizer, we call him. He's the technology editor at Fast Company, at Harry McCracken on Twitter. Anything you want to plug? Anything you're... We are, we're taking off the last week of the year, pretty much. So we're right now we're putting together all these great stories recapping 2018 and looking ahead to 2019. Oh, so while I'm off enjoying myself, we're going to have a ton of good stuff on the site to check out. You've been doing some great long form pieces on uh, fast company that I've, especially your specialty, of course, uh, history, the tech, the history of technology. It's, it's fun to get to write about that stuff. And, Such great stuff. And we do it because people love it. Yeah. Well, I do. Thank you. Fastcompany.com. Thrilled to have, Paris Martineau on the show this week. Your first time. How was it? Was it okay? Oh, it was great. Yeah. That's, we would love to have you back. Me. Well, somebody's got to give you a reward for living in the cesspool of the internet. And I don't mean Wired. <laughs> I mean all those other places you cover in Wired. She writes yep. about the dark side of the net and a lot of great stuff at Wired.com. You do such great work. I'm so glad we could have you here this week. Appreciate it. Thank you. And, of course, my friend Michael Nunez, Deputy Tech Editor at Mashable, who actually came into work. Did you ride your bike there? Uh, I did not. It was raining out. so uh, oh, good. In, yeah, so it wasn't ideal conditions. I don't want to send you home over the bridge in the dark. No, no, I don't want to ride, <laughs> <laughs> ride back okay. in the dark. Thank you for being here, Michael. We really appreciate it. Michael Thanks F. Awesome. Nunez on the Twitter. What's your uh, Twitter handle, Paris? Is it Paris Martineau? Yeah, it's Paris Martin. Don't send her ni but nasty stuff. Send her nice stuff. Say she was smart. <laughs> Say she did a good Thanks, job. Guys. She sounded great. Her microphone was fantastic. Whatever. Say nice things. See, they can't bug me anymore. I must be the only person with a Twitter follower following bigger than half a million people who just walked away from it. That's my everybody thinks I'm Probably, nuts. Yeah. That's nuts. It used to be 600. Seems, by the way, it used to be 611,000. It's now 511,000. I don't know why. Maybe because I walked away. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> uh, hey, it's really great to have you all. Thank you for being here. Uh, we are going to be back next week, right? We have a show or no? Yes. Okay, next week. Actually, that's going to be our big. That's the show where I'm drinking heavily and smoking cigars. We got the Louis Thirteenth cognac, the 100-year-old cognac. We're going to bust it out. It'll be our year-end episode. Michael, you better come because I think you're, we're going to need evidence. I um, was going to say, I feel like I really missed out. <laughs> I was, I was, yeah, I was talking to Michael O'Donnell, our right. photographer. But, yeah, you missed oh. out. We didn't have a – there's no way we haven't figured out how to do the Skype cognac thing yet. But if you're ever in next year, next year. I will save yeah. some for you, okay? I will save a sip for you. Thank Smoking you. Smoking jacket, check. Get it ready. That's the uh, December 23rd edition of – this week at Tech. The following week will be our best of. We always have fun doing that. Some of the best clips from the year gone by. And then we'll be back the week after. So it's going to be fun. Uh, we do twit normally every Sunday afternoon, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, that's 2300 UTC. You can watch us do it live. There's a live video and audio stream at twit.tv slash live. And then you get all the bloopers, all the stuff we have to cut out of the final version. Leo wearing a leak hat. Things like you're going to cut that out, right? Uh, <laughs> no?
Uh, you can also get on-demand versions that apparently do include the leak hat at uh, twit.tv. In fact, all our shows are available on demand at twit.tv. Better yet, if you subscribe in your favorite podcast application, you'll get it automatically. Uh, just look for This Week in Tech. You can even ask your uh, smart device, hey, Echo, play This Week in Tech podcast, and it'll play the most recent version. You can just enjoy it yourself. It's great. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next time. Another twit for our special cognac edition. Another twit is in the can. John's shaking his head no. <laughs> Doing the twit. Doing the twit.